It's a very happy and enjoyable and festive St Andrew's Day indeed. Thank you, Minister. That ends members' business. As the parties were so advised, we are moving straight on to uh, the continuation of the debate from yesterday. I know a number of members, despite that warning, are not in the chamber. Can I say to all of those people, whether in the chamber or not, that if you spoke in the debate yesterday, I expect you to be here for the closing speeches this afternoon. And if anybody who spoke yesterday has not sought prior agreement uh, to not being here, then I am going to name them and shame them when we come to uh, this afternoon. Um, so the next item of business is the continuation of the debate on the Scottish Government's programme for Government 2014-15. Uh, and I call Alec Neill as the first speaker. Five minutes. Is it five? Six. Okay, thank you very much indeed, uh, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, I'd actually like to begin by correcting something that Jackie Bailey said in yesterday's debate, because on a number of occasions she said that over the period the SNP had been in government, the number of people working for Scotland's local authorities who had lost their job was 70,000. I have uh, checked the figures, and I can tell you on the basis of full-time equivalent, uh, the number of people who are uh, the, the reduction in the number of people working for local authorities in Scotland over that period has not been 70,000 but 27,600. But most interestingly, when you look at the analysis of those figures, three local authorities account for 15,000 out of the 27,600. Those three local authorities are Labour-controlled Glasgow City Council, uh, who account for 11,500 of a reduction in the number of people employed, Labour-controlled North, North Lanarkshire Council, which accounts for 1,600, and Labour-controlled Aberdeen City, which accounts for 1,900. So between those three councils, they account between them for 15 out of the 27,500. So I do think maybe in future, for Mrs. Ba Ms. Bailey is quoting numbers, she should maybe check the facts first. And I just want you to register that uh, at the beginning. Now, in the six minutes or so I have now, just over four minutes left, I want to, of course, I'll always take an intervention James from Kelly. Mr. Kelly. Thank you very much, Mr. Neil, for taking that intervention. Does the Minister then accept, as a matter of fact, that thousands of local government workers have lost their jobs because of the cuts imposed by the SNP government? Kevin. If all of these had followed the same employment policies as the Scottish Government, they would all be in a much better position. And I think if you look at the record of your local Labour-controlled authorities, I don't think you have much to boast about. And the budget set by us were originally set by Alistair Darling and Gordon Brown, Mr. Kelly, who are the heckling. ones who imposed the cuts originally. So I really don't think the Labour Party has got much to boast about at all. On a more positive note, Presiding Officer, I want to focus in on my new areas of responsibility because while I can't list all of them, it is a fairly long list, I want to highlight a number of areas where we absolutely, as the First Minister said yesterday, intend to make substantial progress in the period left of this Parliament. I want to begin by also saying that um, even although we're now within 16 months of the end of this Parliament, that there's still a great deal to be done, and that's before we move on to the extended agenda arising from the additional powers, which hopefully will be transferred to this Parliament in the months and years to come. Now, I've uh, identified five or six areas where uh, I will be giving priority to over the next uh, 16 or 17 months or so. And those are housing, fuel poverty, equalities, welfare, pensioners' rights and democratic renewable, new renewal. Let me say, I think it's very important since uh, today of all days, when we're talking about the transfer of power from London to Edinburgh, that it's important for us to remind ourselves of the very important principles established in the declaration by the former First Minister, Alex Salmond, in relation to subsidiarity within Scotland because it's very much a part of the philosophy of this government and the intention of this government that we need to look at the future government of Scotland internally so that we do maximise 
the democratic participation of our people. We all saw from the referendum and the participation in the referendum and the 85% turnout, the fact that there is a real hunger out there for people to become much more engaged than they have been over the last 20 years in the politics and decision making of our country. We want to help people, I will indeed, we want to help people realize that ambition and democratic renewal is a key part of our forward looking agenda. Way, I wonder if you would agree with me that if power is to be devolved, it shouldn't stop at Glasgow City Chambers, but should go down to the actual communities. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I represent a constituency in North Lanarkshire, and I look at some of the ways in which the housing stock in North Lanarkshire is managed, and it's anything but democratic or accountable, and it's a very, very good example of where we need to do much more in our communities to genuinely empower our communities, and empowering tenants much more than we've done in the past is a good example of how we need to do that. Uh, there has been a bit of an attitude in the past where the only empowerment we gave to tenants in some areas was to give them a yes or no choice in the transfer of the housing stock from the local authority to a third party organisation. Now, while any transfer should have the democratic acceptance of the tenants, that's a very, very narrow view of what tenants should be involved in. And I think extending tenant management, tenant control of local authority housing stock is an area for ripe, action, ripe for action in terms of democratic renewal and community empowerment. In the less than a minute I have left, presiding officer, the other area I want to just mention is equalities, and particularly three areas which will be priority for me. One is dealing with domestic abuse. I, despite massive efforts by this parliament, under successive administrations on a cross-party basis, we still have much more to do to eliminate domestic abuse in Scotland, and I will work with all the parties involved to make sure that we do that. Secondly, the relatively new phenomenon of revenge porn very clearly requires to be tackled. It is totally unacceptable and it particularly is damaging for young people. And I think, again, urgent action in that is required. And thirdly, in terms of the public sector appointments, getting more women on boards is absolutely essential. Now, I know when I was health secretary, and obviously the health department appoints more people to more boards than any other function in government, I made a distinct effort to use every possible occasion to maximise the recruitment of women you really onto need to bring it to health our boards. Uh, so I did that, and I think if you look at the health board proportion, it is reasonably high. But we need to extend that and we need to do more in terms of equalities as well as women on boards. I'm sorry I can't do any more in the very limited time I have available, but hopefully that gives some sense of the priorities I intend to follow in the 17 months left of this parliament. Okay, Mark Dodge, followed by Chick Brody. Thank you, presiding officer. And uh, I want to begin, if I can, with my own words of welcome uh, to the first minister and her administration. We are uh, seven years into this SNP government, uh, but I think it's important that we acknowledge uh, what can be seen at least as a change in tone and style uh, from this government over the last two weeks, uh, notwithstanding some of the reaction today over the Smith Commission. Uh, like most colleagues from all sides in this parliament, I want to work with the government uh, when it is taking action to support the lives of people in Scotland. And to that end, there are a number of proposals in the legislative programme which give me encouragement. Just last night, in our debate on Oxfam's Even It Up campaign, I outlined why land ownership reflects just one of the extreme inequalities which afflict our nation and which we need to tackle if we are to build a more progressive society. Less than 500 people own over half the land in our country. Not the threat to individual poverty that would pose if we had less in the way of alternative employment, but still an affront to our sense of fairness and to our broader social and economic well-being. The indications are that Scottish ministers intend to take a slightly more radical approach than that indicated by their initial rather insipid response to the original findings of the Land Reform Review Group. If that is indeed the case, then that will be welcomed on this side of the chamber and we look forward to the launch of the consultation next week. 
Uh, check against delivery. I believe these are the words that often adorn press releases mm -hmm. or press copies of ministerial speeches. And with a similar caveat that we await further detail, there are several other proposals I want to welcome. Uh, the help to mitigate welfare cuts. A stronger focus on the living wage. And who knows, President Officer, maybe uh, Labour and SNP will eventually even see eye to eye on legislation in this area. The Fair Work Convention, with the accompanying focus on gender equality and creating decent, sustainable jobs. And I know that's a, an issue particularly close to the heart of the Finance Secretary, and I hope we can work with them uh, on making progress uh, in this area. Votes for 16 and 17 year olds, an issue which the whole chamber has now come together on, and again, where we make progress. Moves against human trafficking, to which I particularly want to pay tribute to the work of my colleague Jenny Mara. And a commitment to address the needs outlined by Gordon Aikman in his campaign to support those with motor neuron disease. Now, these are just some of the measures where I fully expect Labour to be working constructively with the SNP over the next year or so. On childcare, too, there are the makings of a common agenda. We seem to agree the direction of travel on creating more accessible, affordable and available childcare places. Although the fact that we are moving at a slower pace than the rest of the UK leaves us with some concern. It is perhaps when we move on to the broader issues to do with education that I begin to have uh, some difficulty. There is an immediate and obvious contrast between the stated aims and aspirations outlined by the Scottish Government and the budget decisions taken by this same Government, which could actively hinder their delivery. Labour would entirely support action to raise attainment, particularly that focusing on more deprived areas, including, for example, measures designed to widen access to higher education. Unfortunately, the reality is that across Scotland, this government's funding decisions mean that local authority after local authority is currently having to work out exactly where ministers want to cut education budgets. Just last week alone, we heard how Highland Council, Falkirk and East Renfrewshire are struggling to maintain the priority they wish to give education in the face of Scottish government cuts. Mr McDonald. <clears throat> At yesterday's local government committee, local authorities were extremely positive about the removal of ring fencing of budgets that has taken place under the Scottish Government. So there is great flexibility for local authorities as to how they spend the resources that are allocated to them. But Mr McIntosh, like many of his colleagues, calls for additional funding to local government. Where does he see disinvestment taking place to allow the additional funding that he wishes to see? Not Can only I do I not recognise that picture that Mr Macdonald paints, the, the stark facts are that this government spends its time arguing for full control over fiscal powers from the, uh, the UK government and yet freezes the council tax at an unsustainable level. And, and the, the uh, intellectual paradox that pushes, I cannot believe that the SNP and Mr Macdonald in particular can't recognise that. That not only to cut local authorities in the way he has, but to refuse to give them any powers to raise additional resources themselves puts a straitjacket around local government and gives them no flexibility to address these issues. Yes, Ms Adamson. I, Adamson. I'm just a bit confused, Mr McIntosh. No local authority has to take the council tax freeze voluntary based on the funding from the Scottish Government. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, it's, it's not quite panto season, but Ms Addison did deliver that with a straight face. Uh, as I remember, uh, I'm not sure it's actually called blackmail, but there was an offer given to local authorities that either this... It is pantomime season. So they were given an offer, presiding officer. Order. They were given an offer. They were given an offer. Either take the deal offered by Mr. Swinney and get a decent increase, or don't take it. That includes the council tax fees, or face a cut. Now I'm sorry, but I don't. You're think in that your last exactly thirty a... seconds. <laughs> the last thirty seconds. No, thank you, thank you. I feel I feel like a local authority officer faced with this generous offer from Mr. Mr. Swinney, but no choice whatsoever. So when we're facing education cuts, council tax cuts, bed cuts for delayed discharges, a priority we will support, but the, rea the reality is there is no money going to councils to support that. We will try to work with the Scottish Government. I hope to put the money where the mouth is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McIntosh. Chick Brody, followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you, President Officer. Firstly, may I apologise for any part I may have caused in the confusion regarding my place in the debate yesterday. Uh, this debate, uh, like those of its predecessor programmes, is important as we uh, continue our progress, hopefully our joint progress uh, toward the vision that we certainly have uh, for our country, the direction in which we wish uh, to travel. 
Now, I will not rehearse all of the well-trailed arguments we've had in the last year, and indeed this year, save to repeat a quote from uh, the introduction of last year's programme, which was that per adventure, taking decisions in Scotland works for individuals, it works for families and for communities. This is our matter, how, how the, no matter how the impair, impairments that we face, this is the route that we should travel. And I believe that what this programme for government is and should be about. It is, presiding officer, about taking these decisions with participation. It's about participation of the individuals and communities. It's about empowerment of those communities. It's about ownership and the att attendant responsibility. It's about fairness across society. And it's about, as a fundamental, the maximization of happiness of the individuals in our community. Presiding officer, it was Henry Ford that said nobody can really guarantee the future. The best we can do is size up the chances, manage the risks involved, estimate our ability to deal with them, then make our plans with confidence. And I would argue, presiding officer, that the fundamentals that underpin this program, participation, empowerment, ownership and fairness, will make us more confident to handle whatever the future throws at us. Uh, participation, for example, in the general economy, where it, through, for example, childcare releases a greater opportunity for work. The proposal to increase further funded hours a, a week, not just to three and four year olds, but to disadvantaged two year olds, not just from 16 hours a week, but to 30 hours a week of free childcare, doesn't just create participation, particularly for women in the workplace, but it establishes a long term benefit to the community because of shared communication and experience for those children for those children receiving childcare in their early years. Forgive me, I'll carry on if I may. Participation in the workplace goes beyond that. Success in achieving a high wage, high productivity economy is built on innovation and an improved research and development environment. And it requires, in fact, demands expansion of the principle of participation in the workplace. And the Fair Work Convention that we spoke of last week to improve dialogue between employers, government, public sector bodies, trade unions and employees generally in a marriage between capital and labour is absolutely critical to secure Scotland's highly sought place in the global economy. That participation in the workplace and elsewhere in the Scottish economy requires more than involvement. It requires and it demands ownership, be that part equity ownership in industry and commerce or quasi equity ownership in the public sector employee involvement is absolutely critical. More so, presiding officer, community ownership, and such as in energy activities, is important. But more importantly, more importantly, is the ownership of, of land. Uh, Lloyd George once famously said, the land belongs to the people, and so it should. Not because it's some fanciful dream, but because of harsh, economic facts and I welcome plans to improve and hopefully accelerate proposals in the Community Empowerment Plan a Bill with the intent to acquire, acquire 1 million acres of land for public ownership by 2020. That is a sound proposition. Okay, man. Uh, envisage the extension of compulsory purchase powers? Sorry, I missed that. Would Mr Brodie support the extension of compulsory purchase powers? Check Brodie. It, 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 they should be applied if, if and where necessary. But ultimately, as I say, the plan, uh, hopefully we will follow and, and the bill is set up to do all this, it will uh, embrace the appropriate processes. Avoidance, even reduction uh, of land and property speculation can only benefit businesses and housing for communities over the longer term and thereby our economy. Presiding officer, I have similarly address keystones of participation and ownership, but I also mentioned fairness and happiness. Fairness is not just about the determination of the living wage, though that is very, very important uh, to us. It's about firing the ambitions, the entrepreneurship, the innovation and the internationalisation of Scotland's people and the employment and income that flows from that to develop a tax and social structure that will build on, will secure and will establish fairness a, 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 and individual happiness and that, that should be the basis for a rapid reduction in the monstrous income gap which currently besmirches our society. If we don't address that, then that chasm 
will eventually devour all of us, financially and socially. You've got and lastly, presiding officer, lastly, presiding officer, fairness demands that we eschew rightly uh, our past and current culture uh, and foster gender equality, as has been mentioned, and so also foster fair treatment and representation of all, irrespective of race, a social condition, circumstances, and age. Uh, and that merit, hopefully, once we've sorted that, will be the defining feature of our society. Lastly, President Officer, let us have a programme that takes us one further step towards that participative, owning, fair, uh, meritorious Scotland. It was Chekhov who Chekhov's said... Chekhov's very interesting, but your time... <laughs> Malcolm Chisholm, followed by Christina McKelvey. Chair presiding over I welcome many of the measures and proposals announced in the legislative uh, programme by the First Minister yesterday, not least because several of them were in response uh, to Labour campaigns on, for example, the living wage, 50-50, childcare and ac uh, access to higher education. Having said that, I believe that in some areas the government needs to go further, while in others, such as housing, very little is said in the document. Can I start, however, with an area of complete consensus? On page 41 of the document, it says the Scottish Government will continue to build on Scotland's position at the cutting edge of developments in marine uh, energy. I, I was absolutely devastated this week to hear that the world-leading Palamas wave powered in my constituency uh, went into administration uh, on Monday and yesterday 40 of the 56 highly skilled uh, employees were sacked. I'm meeting Fergus Ewing about that tomorrow morning, but can I just say here that I hope the Scottish Government will do everything it can to ensure that the work of Palamas goes on and that all of those highly skilled employees continue to develop the marine renewable technology we so desperately need. There are many other areas of consensus, trafficking being one, and I must pay tribute to the superb work of my colleague Jenny Mara in that regard. 50-50, obviously, we welcome the proposals on that, and also the proposals to legislate on a specific domestic abuse offence and a specific revenge porn offence. Can I just add in that area of policy, however, that I think the Scottish Government does need to look again at some of the detail of the legislation in relation to stalking. This was featured recently because of the high, prominent, um, the high uh, publicity given to the circumstances faced by uh, uh, Janice uh, Galloway. And I, I, in response to a question, I was told that the Scottish Government is considering changing uh, the law in relation to non-harassment uh, orders. So I hope that will be taken forward in any other action that is needed to protect the victims of stalking as well as the victims uh, of other forms of violence against women. I welcome the child care proposals in general, although I think the government does need to diversify its approach uh, to child care. Of course, we want uh, more uh, nursery provision for uh, three and four year olds, although I think they have to look at the issue of making sure that's two years for everybody. But I think they also need to look at the key issues of flexibility and affordability, which are the, are, are the big issues that Kezia Dugdale has flagged up in all the uh, extensive work she's done on uh, childcare. I welcome the proposals on uh, public health, particularly in relation to e-cigarettes. I support uh, e-cigarettes as a very useful uh, tool for uh, many people trying to uh, uh, stop uh, smoking. So I, I think that, that they are important in that regard. But I would support a ban uh, on uh, e-cigarettes for uh, under 18-year-olds. And I hope also the government will consider limiting the sales uh, of uh, e-cigarettes to tobacco registered uh, outlets. Uh, the other proposals on health I would welcome. I would just say that there is one issue that was in their 2007 uh, manifesto that I would like to flag up. They said then that they would bring in no fault compensation for the NHS. The current system is expensive uh, and slow, and we've had working groups uh, looking at no fault compensation for some time. So I, I hope that there will be an outcome of that, although it doesn't look as if we're going to get an outcome during this Parliament. So I am disappointed in that. Another omission is in relation to uh, private housing. Again, I, I think uh, substantially in response to the great work of, of James Kelly on this, uh, there was a consultation on this uh, recently, but we heard nothing. There's not one word in the document that I can see about private rented housing. And yet uh, last week, for example, we learned that uh, Edinburgh uh, has the, is the second city in the UK in terms of the percentage uh, of a private renter's income that's spent 
on uh, rent. So there clearly is a need for policies in terms of rent capping uh, and, uh, and longer tenancies, which is complementary to that. And I'm very disappointed that we hear, heard nothing about that in uh, the legislative programme uh, uh, announcement yesterday. Another omission was uh, no mention of, the, uh, of a bill on lobbying. Now, people can take different views on lobbying, and I, I don't want to go into the pros and cons of my colleague Neil Finlay's legislation, but it is the procedure of this Parliament that uh, a member can bring forward a bill, but that that bill uh, can be taken over by the government, and at that point, of course, the member leaves it to the government. So I think it is it's quite wrong for the government to say they would take over Neil Finlay's bill and then do absolutely nothing about it. So I think maybe the Standards Committee should uh, look at that. Give way. Fiona McLeod. No, because it was here for part of the debate on the lobbying that it's um, the Standards Committee that are looking at this and we're taking great care over it. So until we have gone through the whole inquiry, it would be inappropriate to make a decision. Malcolm Chisholm. I'm afraid that misses the point that I was making about procedure. The procedure is not being followed, uh, and that is totally unfair to my colleague Neil Finlay. Finally, if I can just end on the Community Empowerment Bill, which has already started. Uh, as I, I'm really looking forward to this as one of the most interesting bills as it goes through Parliament. But I did note a quote from the SCBO on their submission to it, which I can read. I think I've just got time to read. The transfer of assets should not be driven by public sector cost-saving exercise. The basis for asset transfer should be that communities are able to better utilise a public sector asset for their own purposes. And if the last word can be about a current example of that in my constituency where the Grant and Improvement Society are trying to take over some land from EDI, which is basically a, a, a council arm's length body, uh, at the moment that is at the discretion of EDI and, and they've said, the board has said no to the Grant and Improvement Society. I hope they change their mind, but I hope the bill, uh, when it's passed, would force them to change their mind. Thank you, Mr. Chisholm. Christina McKelvey, followed by Liz Smith. Thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer, the First Minister has set out 12 bills that will take us all forward in crucial ways. In the context of social justice, she has committed £100 million to help mitigate the damage caused by welfare, Westminster's welfare cuts. She is leading by example in pushing forward with the application of the living wage of £7.85 an hour from April next. And she has set out forward moves on violence against women, the pilots of Clare's Law, and a particular issue that I have been campaigning on and led the debate on in this chamber on revenge porn. I am especially pleased to hear that the government is committing to giving careful and full consideration to making revenge porn the distribution of intimate images without the consent of those pictured a criminal offence. And I agree with Malcolm Chisholm that maybe that will be an opportunity to look at the stalking laws and see how we can maybe improve those after they've been in practice for a while. This is something on this topic in particular that Scotland could really lead on, and I'm very pleased that this is a component of the legislative plans. Of equal importance is the prospect of the introduction of, introduction of human trafficking and exploitation bill. As colleagues well know, this is another area I have been repeatedly campaigning on and brought it to this Equal Opportunities Com Committee in the last session. It remains one that is outside of the knowledge of the comprehension of many people because it is so shocking. The notion of groups of young men or boys and women and girls locked into dirty rooms to serve men and held prisoner and made to work is beyond the understanding of most of us. The danger is we sideline it because we find it so hard to believe it is actually happening. And believe me, it is. And I would c commend uh, a short film, Nefarious, the Merchant um, of Souls, to uh, the Chamber for um, their um, understanding of how difficult a subject this is. That we are showing ourselves to be tough and determined to obliterate the abuse is testament to our fundamental commitment to equality, fairness and essential human rights. Rights that the Tories would prefer we abandoned. New guidance on support for those with motor neuron disease. And as people know, I have campaigned for seven years and taken many individual local authorities to task on the issue of care charging. And plans to legislate on this if local authorities are not to end this practice have to be commended. And I also commend Gordon Aikman and pay tribute to him in raising this um, topic to the top of the agenda. On domestic abuse, abuse, we've all welcomed all of these and we should impact, uh, use these laws to impact very, very positively on the lives of many, many, many Scots. This Scottish Government already has an impressive record, one that voters clearly recognised, which is why the SNP now has a membership of over 93,000, more than the Lib Dems, UKIP, combined right across the UK. Scots have recognised the hollow promises of that famous vow, and we've seen just hollow that was today. Within a few hours, we saw the Westminster Government 
disengaging from what it had committed to in order to buy a no vote, threatening pensioners, delivering dishonest messages about what a yes vote would mean and telling those on benefits that they'd be left with little or nothing. On the streets during the campaign, we heard the evidence of those false statements over and over again. Oh, one elderly lady told me, but they told me I wouldn't get my pension on Friday if I voted yes. If there is another referendum tomorrow, presiding officer, I'm confident we'd have a different reply, but that isn't where we are now, and we must move forward unless or until the sovereign people of Scotland demand something different. Maybe James Kelly is going to give James us something Kelly. different. Can I maybe remind Ms McKelvey that the, the referendum's over? Um, <laughs> Scot Scotland voted no by a, a majority of 400,000, and we all, we all need to move on and part of the vow being delivered today is part of that. Lucina McKelvey. Yes, Scotland did vote because they voted for a vow, a vow that was empty, that was hollow, and you're holding hands with your Tory pals across the chamber once again to justify the fact that you turned your back on the Scottish people. We have limited control over what we can do now for ourselves. Within those control, our First Minister's legislative programme is clear and committed to the protection of our most vulnerable citizens. Do you remember them, I ask the Labour Party, because they know that they have been forgotten. Therefore, it is disappointing to see the very limited offer from Smith. Those, where's the equalities? Where's the minimum wage? Where's our tax and revenues? All reserved to Westminster. In spite of the predictable disappointment of Smith report, we must now up our game and work even harder to meet the demands of the 1.6 million people who voted for independence and those who voted no based on the vow. Rightly, those people will not be content with the limited controls. It really hurts the truth, doesn't it? Really, really hurts. Or Smith, allow us to operate less than 30% of our taxes will be set in Scotland Ms. and Mara, only 20% of the welfare budget. Down. Only 20% of the welfare budget will be in our own control. Yet from the recent polls, we know that 75% of Scots, you know those ones you turn your back on, want a parliament to have total, yes, total control over welfare policy. Our powers do not match the promises and they certainly do not match the aspirations of the Scottish people. And we have a duty, a responsibility not to sit and laugh at the people of Scotland, to the sovereign people of Scotland, all of them, yesers and noes, and that ambition, this government programme is clear statement, the SNP government's commitment to those common values of prosperity, fairness and equality, the lack of ambition, imagination and just sheer anything for the pro Member's union got parties. Ten more seconds. It's not the settled will of the Scottish people and you will feel the full force of this when they realise you have reneged on the vow. Liz Smith, followed by Rob Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, let me uh, be positive. And can I begin by saying that we particularly welcome uh, two aspects of the Scottish Government's announcements yesterday uh, relating to education and young people. Uh, specifically, the growing issue about how best to support children with additional support needs. And secondly, that there will now be full focus on addressing the attainment gap. These are both critical issues within Scottish education, uh, particularly as they bring very specific challenges to some of our most disadvantaged children. The statistics speak for themselves, and in the Conservative-led debate just a few weeks back, we all agreed that the current state of affairs is simply not good enough. So we very much uh, welcome these two points. I'm not entirely persuaded, I have to say, of the need for uh, new attainment officers in every local authority, since I think the directors of education are probably the right people to have the handle on that. But no, let's get... Let, I, won't, I won't just now, if you don't mind. I, I think that the Scottish Government needs to explain exactly what that role is going to be, how that uh, funding stream will be provided, and also just... I'd be very interested to know what the uh, criteria will be uh, in terms of measuring uh, the actual outcomes. Because... The First Minister uh, was actually wrong yesterday when she offered the view, uh, and she said this in her speech, that against uh, every main measure, she said, Scottish school education is getting uh, better. 
That is not factually true. And if she cares to read uh, essays by uh, people like Keir Bloomer and Lindsay Patterson, for whom I know the Scottish Government has great respect, uh, they have flagged up very carefully, uh, praising where it is due, but also setting out where we are not uh, doing so well, and we've actually fallen back. Uh, so just as the previous uh, Cabinet Secretary, I think, was wrong when he argued a year ago that Scotland does not have any failing schools, the First Minister needs to be careful to present an absolutely accurate picture. I, I won't if you don't mind. Of course, improvement is not all about money. We've had several robust debates in this chamber about what we need to do about the problem, and that is now set against a particularly challenging economic environment for councils, which Ken McIntosh uh, referred to. We've had councils discussing a possible increase in class sizes. We've had them possibly talking about reduction in the school day, some people starting school at age six instead of five, uh, all to save money. So I think there are serious issues uh, there. And the Conservatives will say again, unashamedly, that this only heightens the need for some radical reform, a radical look at how councils actually do manage uh, schools. And if uh, we don't believe that they are the right people, then I think we need to have a debate about that. So we make schools absolutely accountable to those who matter most, pupils, parents and teachers. And on this uh, theme of choice, uh, we very much uh, welcome uh, Sir Ian Wood's proposals, bring more diversity into education, something that my colleague Mary Scanlon uh, will talk about uh, in her contribution. And we also warmly rec recommend uh, that the government is right when they come to concentration on uh, literacy. Now I come to childcare, and it is undoubtedly good to hear about the Scottish Government's uh, proposals uh, to ex ex expand on this, and uh, we very much uh, support that. But I think just to pick up the point that Malcolm Chisholm made, it is about flexibility, it's also about uh, the affordability of it. Um, but again, I don't believe that we'll be able to do anything about the social justice in some of this if we are not prepared to take uh, very strong action about this birthday discrimination. As Ruth Davidson said yesterday uh, when she tackled the First Minister on this, it is absolutely wrong that because of the date of the birthday of a child that they are not provided with the same access uh, to nursery provision as those who are born in other parts of the year. And I will ask the First Minister, again I wrote to her last week about this, the Scottish Conservatives will keep on going on this issue until we get some progress. Let me turn now very quickly to further and higher education. And I think one has to wonder why it is that university governance is back as a priority. Not only did this parliament carry out a very thorough review of university governance within the uh, context of the post-16 bill, not only has there been an amended code of governance agreed following the excellent work of Lord Smith of Kelvin, who obviously has his hands full in other ways today, and not only is there a continuing inability of the Scottish Government to produce any proof whatsoever that universities are not running well because of a problem of governance. Notwithstanding all these things, this government puts university governance as a priority within the new education bill. And I don't think many people in the, in the sector understand that, and they certainly don't understand it when obviously there are far more pressing issues like uh, college places. Now, I've heard many times from the Scottish Government that we shouldn't really worry too much about the college situation because the full-time equivalents have kept up extremely well. And that's absolutely true, they have. But that is not the statistic that we should be dealing, dealing with. Yesterday, the First Minister spoke very eloquently, I have to say, about the need for greater flexibility in the workforce and a job market that is increasingly responsive to the needs of young people. That is the exact point about college places. It is the college places which best serve some of the disadvantaged in society, women, part-time places. These are the ones about which there has to be greatest uh, concern. And I, I come back to the point that I think to target university governance where no problem exists, at the same time uh, as ignoring some of the college issues, is unacceptable. So, presiding officer, I will end my comments on exactly that point. I think this government is undeniably left-wing and undeniably keen to extend the powers of government. So while we will support some aspects of the programme, the expansion of childcare, additional support needs, tackling the attainment gap, improving literacy, and of course eradicating human trafficking, we will not stand by and allow the state to be increasingly undermining the rights and freedoms of individuals, families and communities. And on that principle, this government can expect very fierce opposition from these benches. Rob Gibson, followed by Alice McInnes. Uh, thank you very much, presiding officer. Um, as to underline the fact that this is a radical government, radical land reform is rightly at the centre of the social justice debate. The Land Reform Review Group final report, The Land of Scotland and the Common Good, 
sets the tone of the wide range of land reform policies contained in the SNP programme. We can transform our nation's fortunes through the optimum use of that most basic natural resource. Land reform will deliver participation, prosperity and fairness. But above all, we have to diversify ownership to create social and environmental sustainability. Inequalities in Scotland are summed up by the most concentrated pattern of land ownership in Europe. Land reform is based on the public interest, which has overwhelming support in this Parliament. First, we need to know who owns Scotland. Next, we need to build local capacities to own and utilise the land sustainably. And crucially, the proposed Land Commission can facilitate the best ways to transfer land, whether public or private, to a new set of non-traditional owners. In, uh, a good example of the new hope in land ownership has received unjustifiably mixed coverage this week. The Isle of Gia community buyout in 2002 has transformed the island with a growing population and a variety of new commercial activities to complement farming and tourism. The BBC nevertheless hinted this week of financial trouble for the Gia Heritage Trust, which took over uh, the island for about £4 million in 2002, saying that it was almost £3 million in the red. But the Trust replied it has invested in housing and other developments on the island, some of which has been borrowed, some granted from supporting organisations and some raised from the island's own businesses and efforts. In addition to improving our housing stock, they say, £1 million was paid back to lenders within a year of the original purchase of the island. Over £800,000 has been raised through the Trust's renewable companies and the value of the island has increased to over £7 million. They have recently carried out a strategic review supported by Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Poseidon Officer, a typically hostile press, has focused on a grumpy farmer, alleged divisions amongst islanders and implied incompetence among community leaders, not on their successes. These islanders are due to take part in a vote of confidence in the chairwoman of the Trust this week. This sits in stark contrast to the conduct of private estates that sprawl across our landscape. We never know how much in the red they are, and the media rarely asks. Also, families who live on such large estates like those owned by the 432 individuals and trusts that control half of rural Scotland never, ever get asked their opinions about the future of their land. Lairds avoid taxes through skilful accountants, and James Hunter and Company suggested to the Scottish Affairs Committee in Westminster that huge landholders offset losses on land through tax accounting via non-landed enterprises. All these powers are still reserved and not on the offer by the Smith Commission. I give way. Uh, I, I thank Mr Gibson for giving way. We do acknowledge, nonetheless, that many of these private landowners are doing a highly successful job when it comes to the economy of Scotland. Rob Gibson. As Andy Whiteman said in the National Newspaper today, these ideas I'm talking about will be opposed every bit of the way by powerful vested interests. There's a powerful vested interest. The Lairds, you know, in some cases, had a thousand years to build their domains. <laughs> So it will take community bodies like Gia, Egg, South Uist and Noider a few more than 10 years to sort out the mess they often left behind. The North Harris Community Trust has successfully built new homes, run the deer shooting, creates renewable energy income, as charted by Fiona McKenzie in a recent book. She calls it Places of Possibility. That sums up the intent of this land reform package. Presiding officer, the review of local government finance can take land value tax seriously and look at many others uh, which are, are uh, possible in its review. I want tenant farming re reform included in the land reform bill, like many others, and real powers given to the Land Commission to chart the how as well as the what of sustainable land ownership. We could measure success of land reform against membership of Scottish land and estates which is 2,000 at present. Perhaps in 10 years' time, it should be 20,000 in a vibrant mix of communities, smaller landholders and redu reduced scale sporting estates. Presiding officer, why not? As the land leaguers used to say, the land is before us. I commend the ambition and common sense in the Scottish Government's plans.
Many thanks. I now call Alison McInnes to be followed by Dennis Robertson. <clears throat> Thank you, President Officer. It would be remiss of me not to start with a mention of the Smith Commission unveiled just a few hours ago. Let us be clear, it is a bold package, new powers to give the Scottish Parliament the muscle it needs to build a fairer society with opportunity for all. Scottish Liberal Democrats have championed Home Rule for decades, so today is exciting for us. £20 billion in tax powers and £3 billion to build a Scottish welfare system. It delivers on the vow and more. Vow max. It has been achieved through unprecedented. Let me make some headway. It has been achieved through unprecedented cross-party talks, as all working meaningfully together, leaving behind the politics of division and grievance. And that must continue. There must be a constructive relationship between both Scotland's governments. <clears throat> In this Parliament, over the last two years, the SNP has relied upon its majority. It has failed time and again to listen to reasoned, principled opposition, and has built those policies through, regardless. So I welcome the First Minister's indication that this is going to change, that wherever parties believe they have a good idea, that it will be listened to. And with that consensus in mind, I'll start on a positive note. There are many principles in the programme for government which Scottish Liberal Democrats share, and many areas where I think the government will find ready support. Votes for 16 and 17-year-olds and land reform, to name a couple. I also wholeheartedly welcome progress towards a new law on revenge pornography and I look forward to the introduction of a human trafficking and exploitation bill. But, presiding officer, I want to focus the remainder of my marks on, remarks on areas where there is less consensus. The previous Justice Minister took the government down a path that a lot of us are uncomfortable with. So I want to lay down a challenge to the First Minister at this crossroads to change direction. She and the new Justice Minister have an opportunity to change direction, to be more liberal. They can carry the consensus in areas where there is common ground. In others where there is political discord, they should at least be willing to listen. So I hope they are listening today, because I want to see changes in a few key areas. I want to halt on the overuse and de detrimental police tactic of non-statutory stop and searches. Used correctly, stop and search is a legitimate tool to prevent and detect crime, but Scots are seven times more likely to be subjected to this tactic than people in England and Wales. These individuals are searched when there are no grounds whatsoever to suspect them. We found out last week that over 8,000 searches had been carried out by armed officers on routine duties. Whoever believes that is not a heavy-handed tactic? The Human Rights Commission, the Children's Commissioner, charities and more share our concerns about unregulated and unaccountable nature of non-statutory stop and search. We are talking about hundreds of thousands of unjustified intrusions, purposeless interactions not based on any evidence or intelligence. And even the Scottish Police Authority has concluded there is no robust evidence that these prevent crime. So I ask this government to back my efforts to amend the Criminal Justice Bill to ensure that all stop and searches are regulated based on suspicion of wrongdoing and rooted in law. I want the powers of the Chief Constable to be set out. We must move away from a system which has allowed armed officers to routinely patrol our communities without this ever being subject to public debate or parliamentary scrutiny. The need to define roles and boundaries has been exposed time and again on armed police, but also on the removal of valued local services Operational independence has been used to stifle legitimate debate. It is a barrier to due scrutiny and good governance. Only yesterday, COSLA wrote to the Chief Constable and the SPA to stress the need for local scrutiny and early, meaningful dialogue on national policies. So we need to move away from a one-dimensional view of policing. The number of bobbies on the beaten crime figures do not trump all these other concerns. The police must operate within a framework set by this Parliament and the national force cannot be allowed to shirk transparency, accountability and community engagement any longer. With transparency and local community empowerment in mind, I hope the Scottish Government will support the changes that I seek. We will, of course, return to the Government's flawed and ill-conceived plans to scrap corroboration. I am sure we all look forward to the publication of the review and that there will be a good amount of debate following that. But again, I say that I hope this Minister will be more open to listening than his predecessor. I also hope the Justice Secretary can bring renewed focus to the need to reduce the prison population and to improve the criminal justice system, and particularly our prisons. Health figures out this week show that complaints were up in our NHS. That rise was due to the inclusion of prison population, 
And the main areas of concern were mental health services and rehabilitation services. We really must make progress on this. I hope that the government will also be willing to look at increasing the use of community disposals and improve the situation for female offenders. By progressing the recommendations of the Angelini Commission, we can ensure we have the facilities which are suitable for the prison population which we have. I want to echo what Willie Rennie said yesterday. Where we agree, we will be glad to support this government's legislation. And when we disagree, we will always work constructively to improve it. Many thanks. Can I remind members that this debate is once again oversubscribed? Um, so if members could take less than six minutes, that would be helpful. I call Dennis Robertson to be followed by Alex Rowley. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm sure there's many Liberals out there maybe scratching their head thinking, Home Rule? No, this is nothing like Home Rule that we got from Smith Commission. Uh, and maybe Alison McInnes is maybe a Liberal Democrat and maybe not the Liberal that, uh, uh, that once uh, fought for Home Rule. Presenting officer, can I associate myself with everything that Rob Gibson said regarding the land reform? And indeed, I was actually going to speak about it. But then I, I was maybe sort of stepping back just a little, given the, some of the estates in my own constituency. And I'm not sure if the law of treason is still is on the statute book, but perhaps I should maybe move away from Royal Deeside just for a moment. But, Presiding Officer, there's so much to be welcomed in the, the, the bills that are being proposed. Uh, and the First Minister yesterday spoke about, spoke about fairness, spoke about prosperity, and spoke about participation. And, you know, President Officer, we've just gone through the most amazing participation of, of a lifetime, of perhaps the, 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 the politics has never, ever witnessed before. The engagement of so many people um, in all our communities. And the ones that probably, I think, uh, came across, you know, more than others in terms of this engagement was the young people. And, I, and I'm glad to see that we've got cross-party support for the franchise for the 16- to 17-year-olds. And it is just a pity that there are 16- and 17-year-olds in Scotland that are not going to be able to vote in the general election. But there was another group, um, presiding officer, that I, I uh, met uh, at Dynamic Earth, <clears throat> along with the man Begg, actually, at Hustings. Uh, and it was a group of people with disabilities. Uh, and they actually felt that their voice was not being heard. They felt their voice was not being listened to um, throughout the, the uh, engagement during the referendum. And, and during that um, debate and hustings, they made it very clear that, that politics needed to move aside and their voice needed to be listened to. And this is why I'm actually quite excited about what is being proposed um, within the, the bills. And I sincerely hope the Cabinet Secretaries with the appropriate portfolios uh, can look at trying to move forward the aspirations of some of our, our, our people with disabilities. Because it's all very well, presiding officer, uh, going down the route of just gender e um, equality. And I support it. Uh, I, I perhaps I'm, I'm getting into dangerous water here, presiding officer, when I say I'm maybe not a great fan of quotas. But Something needs to be done to try and ensure that we do have a sense of equality within our society. And that equality, and I sincerely hope that um, Paul Grice is not fearing for his job uh, as a, a chief executive in this parliament, uh, uh, because we do need some good men at the top as well as good women, presiding officer. But the, the thing about the equality area is to try and ensure that it is equality for all. And I, and I suppose today that people with disabilities have asked me to come forward today and give their voice an airing in this chamber. Because when we're looking at increasing our apprenticeship programme from 25,000 to 30,000, they want to be included in that programme. They want a part of that apprenticeship programme to look at their specific needs. Because people with disabilities, a presiding officer, that can work, that want to work, that are able to work, need the skills, need the opportunity. And that's all they're asking for, the opportunity, the opportunity to actually contribute to society. They don't want to be known as the scroungers. They don't want to be known as the people who are looking for handouts, because they're not. They want to have 
a full participative part within our society and feel that they belong and can actually deliver. And this is why prosperity and fairness comes into you know, what I'm talking about, presiding officer, because many people with disabilities in the workplace give more. I would say give more than maybe their counterparts because they know they've had to work hard to get there. <coughs> I remember when I was first elected, I was asked, would I be a role model for people with disabilities? And I was slightly hesitant to say, well, yes, but maybe no. And the reason it was a sort of yes, but maybe no is because I didn't want to be seen as the, the blind MSP. I want to be seen as a, an MSP who oh, just so happens to be blind. And this is the point about people with disabilities in the community and in the workplace. They shouldn't be seen for their disability. They should be seen for the ability they have to bring forward the talents, the skills uh, that we should be looking to try and, and, and find uh, the ways and opportunities to ensure that they have that uh, uh, focus maybe within the job market. And this is why I'm quite excited about what's happening within the education bill. Because I would provide the appropriate support for people, it gives them the opportunity, that appropriate support in their early education to take them forward, to look at opportunities where they can probably use their talents and skills. Presiding officer, I, I don't have a degree. I didn't go to university. And university, for me, isn't the, 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 the goal that maybe many people uh, maybe aspire to. It's about using your talent and skill and opportunity. And if it's through college to be a tradesperson, whether it be a plumber, electrician, a slater, uh, someone in, in construction, absolutely fine. Because we don't need graduates to do a lot of these jobs. Nice if you've got the degree, but we don't necessarily need that. I'm and afraid I must ask you to draw to a close, please. Yeah. And this is why Serene Wood's uh, report is exciting. But we need to be inclusive and we need to be fair and we need to be equal. So my plea is look at the people <laughs> in our communities who have disabilities and give them a chance. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. I now call Alex Rowley to be followed by Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I certainly am pleased to be speaking in this debate and in six minutes I can't go through everything I think in terms of this document, but I certainly welcome it because I believe we need to move beyond the Constitution and start to have a discussion and a debate about how we tackle the big issues that are out there and how we, how we give everybody the opportunity in life, how we tackle poverty and how we tackle inequality. If I could mention two areas within, within this paper that, that I think um, are very good and, and we need to see action and see them moving on. Firstly, in terms of domestic violence, there has been progress made over the last decade, the last decade more, where, where police authorities, uh, community safety partnerships are doing a lot more work, and, 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 and that's to be commended. But at the same time, that has not resulted in the numbers of domestic violence cases and those suffering for domestic violence falling. So there's more to be done, and I absolutely welcome that. Um, the pilots in Aberdeen and Ayrshire is something that, that I'm glad is mentioned in this document. And Hopefully, we can see how they work and pick them up. In terms of human trafficking, and Christina McKelvey mentioned that earlier, um, sometimes the terminology human trafficking doesn't quite, quite hurt. What we're talking about is modern day slavery. Um, and, and, and I think people would be appalled by that. And I think, again, I commend the Scottish Government for picking up on those issues and bringing those issues forward. It would be right for me, I think, to mention the council tax, because I have, since coming into this parliament through the local government committee, um, made the arguments that we need to review how local government is funded. And again, I welcome the review, the commission, however you want to put that. Um, and I think we, we need to, in local authorities and everybody working together, we need to look at a, a way forward for, for, for properly funding local government. The reality at the end of the day is that, that anybody can cut taxes. Um, there, are, there are countries where you have very low taxes, but you have very, very poor public services, and that needs to be addressed. I would say that, that many in local government, myself in the past as well, in terms of the funding that's there to mitigate the council tax freeze, many of us in local government argued that it was our money anyway. And if Mr Swinney was, was seriously saying that the money that is there that's going in to mitigate the council tax freeze, whilst local authorities would argue it's not enough, 
Um, if that money was to come out, um, the problem being that any council who was to raise the council tax, I think in Fife's case, before you even started, you would have to raise four or five million pounds in order to get past that money itself. Therefore, that money will need to stay with local government, regardless of what the, the new system of taxation, if there's a new system of taxation to go in. And that's a point perhaps I can take up with the Finance Secretary and the Deputy First Minister at another point. Within the statement yesterday for Nicola Sturgeon, she talked about bed blocking, rightly so. I think Alec like Neil's looking a bit more relaxed sitting down the other day than perhaps he was last week, the week before, as health secretary. And I've always said that regardless of the political colour in this, in, in this place of the administration, the reality is that health, health and social care, there are major, major challenges that are there, regardless who it is that's running the government in Scotland, and we need to be able to face up to those challenges. But I was disappointed yesterday because the First Minister um, basically said that £15 million would be made available, £5 million for the Scottish Government, £5 million for NHS boards, and £5 million from local authorities. But regardless of whether you think it's a reasonable settlement or not for local government, the fact is that local authorities, the length and breadth of Scotland, regardless of what political parties running the administration in those authorities are facing major challenges and are cutting services and are having to cut services. And suddenly where they'll, they'll come up with this five million to add to that, the fact is in five, NHS five are currently through the acute budget overspending some place in the tune of three, four million. The former health secretary did tell me that that will be pulled back in. But last, no, I've got too many points to make in six minutes. Last, last year, that, that NHS five actually overspent in its acute um, um, service by, by a, a, over £8 million. Pounds. And, and therefore, that had to be clawed for some place. And that's why we're not seeing a transfer of resources coming for acute into community care and why we've got the big problems here. So I think, you know, the, the announcement of £15 million. Pound, but I would want to pick up, Alec Neil said earlier about today, talking about the transfers of Perth from London to Edinburgh. But we need to go further and, and, and we need to look at the transfer of powers from, from, from certainly London to Edinburgh, but the transfer of powers to local authorities. I genuinely believe and sincerely believe that if we are going to tackle poverty and inequality in Scotland, then we will do so through partnership. Partnership with local government, partnership with community planning partners, and partnership through, so that there is an anti-poverty strategy in the Scottish Government that goes through every level of government. And that anti-poverty strategy is then part of a partnership with local authorities going forward. In terms of the Early Years Collaborative, for example, there is a lot of good work going on out there. But we need to be prepared to tackle um, those areas of the highest deprivation and the highest inequality. And it's through partnership with the third sector, partnership with local government. And if you look with some of the local authorities across Scotland, you'll see some excellent work going on, family centres, early intervention, targeting resources so that if we're going to tackle poverty, we need to tackle the causes of poverty. And as I, as I run out of time, if I can just mention in terms of schools and education, I think we've got to be much more ambitious. Ambitious. As a Finnish County presiding officer, we've got to be much more ambitious. We've got to look at a new approach involving um, colleges, involving employers, so that we actually start from the early years and bring about sorry, a revolution in education. Because the one thing I would agree with Liz Smith, we need to do much better than we're currently doing. Before I move on, I have to give members fair warning that I'm afraid I'll have to cut them dead at six minutes if they can't keep to their time. Claire Adamson to be followed by Jenny Mara. Thank you very much, presiding officer. There's absolutely no doubt that this programme for government will create more and better paid jobs. It will create a strong and more sustainable economy. It will build a fairer Scotland. It will tackle inequality and it will pass significant powers to our people and our communities. However, I do regret a part of the government's plan from government, um, and I see that that doesn't even get my Cabinet Secretary's attention, but uh, what I regret is the sentence that says £104 million in 2005 to 2016 to mitigate welfare reforms being imposed by Westminster. I regret that sentence because it would have been so much better if the decisions about welfare to have been made here in Scotland, where our money could have been used for the benefit of people and not to undo wrongs from elsewhere. 
I was hopeful that the Sinus Commission might have given us some hope in this direction, um, but I stand with the STUC as being underwhelmed. Jackie Bailey. The member for taking an intervention. I genuinely took hope from the Smith Commission when they said they would give the power to this Parliament to set their own benefits. Claire Adamson. What we need is control of the whole welfare system, which is not coming to Scotland. <laughs> Presiding officer, by any measure, austerity, whether it's promised by the Labour Party or delivered by the Tories and Lib Dems, austerity is a field policy. A Chancellor who has staked his entire reputation of the UK Government on aggressive de deficit reduction, regardless of dreadful economic and social cost, has categorically failed, and we see, in some measures, borrowing actually increasing. And the social cost of austerity Britain is not working. P.O. President Officer, I return to a New Scientist article that I've quoted in this Parliament before from 2013, which talks about the true co cost of cuts. And it says the immediate consequences of austerity may give way to more enduring and insidious its effects on health. It is plausible that protracted economic hardship will lead to an increase in heart attacks, strokes and depression. Stress hormones are known to trigger it and exacerbate these conditions. And it is hard to argue that those worrying about security of their jobs, homes, families and finances are not experiencing high levels of stress. They go on to say the effects of health, on the other hand, largely go undiscussed in the political aid arena. This article, I believe, shows that the assumption that when austerity ends and the belt tightening goes away and house prices start to rise and the economy improves, that health problems will not exist. But people affected by those problems will undergo genetic transformation. For some babies in the womb, it will happen because of the stress hormones of their mothers, and it will be a generational problem that we will have to face in Scotland. What is really worrying about austerity is it's not, a well, it's not about the wealth of our nation, it's also detrimental to the health of our nation. And that is why I'm so pleased that while I regret the necessity, necessity to mitigate for problems from elsewhere, I do welcome the measure the government's work programme is, has designed to tackle poverty, to tackle health and social inequalities in our country. Can I go on to talk about the community empowerment, which is very welcome, and I look forward to the People and Communities Fund, which will have an additional £10 million to allocate next year, and that will double the resource that will be able to deliver power to our communities. I also welcome the bill that will end the historic poll tax debt collection, and I also welcome the manifesto commitment to establish an independent commission to examine fairer alternatives to the current council tax system. And the Commission will be established in conjunction with local authorities in COSLA and it will start its work early next year to deliver an alternative. And um, I listened very carefully to Ali Shirley's concerns about the council tax um, and um, I'm a bit more sympathetic to hearing it from him other, and not from the rest of the Labour benches who of course stood in a manifesto promise of a council tax freeze. It's been affected. Order, please. <laughs> Fully funded. Oh. Um, the council tax Order. freeze has been attacked in this chamber by Labour, by Tories, Order, and regrettably please. by the G Green Party yesterday. And while I welcome the commitment to seek a fairer system, I must defend what has been an essential policy across my region in central Scotland. Alex Salmond at the SMP conference talked of the £1,200 average that hard-pressed, hard-working families had saved through the council tax freeze. And I feel I have to do a bit of history lesson on this, because the council tax was a tax out of control. It had risen by, by nearly 50%. Council tax accounts for only 10.8% of revenues for councils. Final minute. But, but fa families were hard pressed by this. And I remind them, in Labour heartland of North Lanarkshire, 83% of families live in Band D or below properties. And that £1,200 to them was an essential lifeline when they were hard pressed by the, the financial downturn and the current. I can't believe that I'm hearing Labour members say that the 52,363 people in North Lanarkshire and Bandy properties didn't deserve the Order, council tax please. freeze. That's, that's money to really hard pressed families. This idea that there are middle classes running around, hordes of them rubbing their hands in glee 
uh, benefiting. Order, is please. Ridiculous. We want to hear the member it's closing. Poor families, hard pressed families, struggling families that have benefited from the council tax freeze, and it's actually a lifeline to them well, over the course of this government. Well Thank you. And I now call Jenny Mara to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Presiding officer, the government's legislative programme shows that the SNP under Nicola Sturgeon is finally looking at the business of governing our country. Twelve bills across a range of issues show much potential. But the proof will be, as always, in what the government intends to do, how much time and energy they will spend in driving change forward, and if they will meet these priorities with resource and budget commitments. On educational attainment, presiding officer, attainment in my own, own home city of Dundee is not nearly as high as it should be. The government has said that they will put an attainment advisor in each local authority. Great. But how will this be backed up? Will there be targets for improvement? How will these targets be met? What resource will the attainment advisor have at their disposal? This is the meat of change. Just a few weeks ago in Dundee, early years practitioners who were all trained in Read Write Inc, the literacy support for primary one and two, were removed from the classroom by the SNP and redeployed into nurseries to meet the government's 600 hours childcare commitments. Now that came at the expense of literacy. And it is this kind of detail that will truly be the proof of whether the First Minister's programme will be transformative. Now, there is a commitment in the programme, presiding officer, to implement the Wood Commission's recommendations. And although the government still has not formally responded to the Wood Commission, I hope we might expect to see that in the new year, because we need a lot of detail on how that will work. I attended a seminar last week at Dundee and Angus College on implementing Wood's proposals across our region. Colleges, local businesses and schools are all thinking now about how Wood will work. I feel the government is falling slightly behind on Wood at the moment. They need to respond to the recommendations and show leadership on how they expect Wood to be implemented or I believe they risk losing momentum on the important issue of youth employment. I hope their response will be published soon. Presiding officer, central to Wood is the restoration of vocational education. But this must be matched by action and budget. As Liz Smith said, the 140,000 cut in college places robs young people of opportunities. And John Swinney's flat cash settlement for colleges this year goes no way to alleviating this situation. And I hope that the Deputy First Minister, in his summing up this afternoon, will be able to tell us how the commitment to implement Wood will be supported by his budget for colleges. Because he knows, and I have told him in this chamber, that over 11,000 people applied to Dundee and Angus College this autumn, but 6,000 of them were unable to get a place. What of the government's youth guarantee for all these youngsters? Now, the Fair Work... The, no, thank you. Sorry, I've got a lot to get through today. Presiding officer, the Fair Work Convention is a great opportunity. It has been committed to in this programme by the First Minister. But Annabel Ewing and Nicola Sturgeon should be clear that they will act on its outcomes. Perhaps, presi perhaps presiding officer, they should make a vow. Um, because the vows are being delivered, because too many, too many recommendations lie dusty on the shelf. The transformative Christie Commission, for instance, very little of that has been acted on by this government, despite their warm words at the time. The 30 recommendations in the Working Together review that was put together by the Scottish Government and the STUC, we still have no commitment from the Scottish Government on how many of these recommendations they will implement. I hope we can make progress on this soon, and I know that the STUC is watching progress on this very carefully. Presiding officer, I was very pleased yesterday to see the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Bill on the government's agenda. The Human Trafficking Bill is the first ever human rights bill to come before the Scottish Parliament, so it will be a poignant moment when it is published. It has been estimated by agencies that there were 55 victims of human trafficking in Scotland last year. But we know, the agencies know, and the people at the front line of this who work with victims know that this is just the tip of the iceberg. Trafficking victims are in all of our communities, urban and rural. They are brought to this country, many on the promise of a better life, and are held and exploited. Many are sexually exploited, and many are held for forced labour. 
no or little pay in awful living conditions. If I told the Chamber presiding officer that my office has had reports of teenage girls being trafficked back and forward across Scotland for sexual exploitation, the Chamber will know how important this legislation is. I look forward to the publication of the bill. It most importantly should contain a legal right for victims to get the protection they need, and this proposal has the support of over 50,000 people. Presiding officer, I wish the First Minister well with her programme for government. Her talk of consensus is good and it's nice, but she has a majority in this parliament and she has a lot of support. She should do something bold to make Scotland a better place, and Pen that will be her legacy. Many thanks. I call Roger Campbell to be followed by Mary Scanlon. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. There is much to be welcomed in the programme for government. It contains several bills that, whilst clearly of wide national interest, will also have a genuine demonstrable impact on individuals, particularly individuals who most need help. Uh, I am pleased that the Scottish Pi Parliament pioneered the inaugural annual Care as Parliament in 2012, and I am pleased to see that their needs remain a priority for this government. And whilst it is undoubtedly the case that the vast army of unpaid carers save the health and social services a substantial amount of money every year, giving carers a say on top of that financial support and on top of respite care, for example, should be a priority. So I am glad that this will be recognised in legislation. And like many here today, I was fortunate to attend the dinner at the Preston Field Hotel last week, where the clear highlight for me was not, I have to say, the two victory speeches of the First Minister, but Gordon Aikman's speech acknowledging the Justice Award, Judges Award, when he spoke on behalf of the needs of MMD sufferers and others. I am glad that the issue of social care charging has been recognised in a meaningful way by the FM in her speech yesterday, and I am hopeful that this Parliament can work on that issue together. I also welcome the continuing commitment to widening the access to higher education and the increase in funding for the Impact for Access Fund. Representing St Andrews University, which I do, I recognise the university's commitment to widening access, but I also recognise that we still have some considerable way to go. On participation, I'm pleased that we do have a consensus on extending the franchise to 16- and 17-year-olds, and I hope that the necessary legislation can be introduced as quickly as possible to enable young people to vote in 2016. Some legislation in the programme for government will, however, have an impact on those who have no say on the political process, but arguably need our help more than anybody else. Uh, I speak, of course, of the Human Trafficking Bill, which Jenny Maher has just referred to. The introduction of that bill is, I believe, a significant step in the right direction and one that requires and deserves full support across this chamber. On that basis, I'd like to add my commendation and my thanks to Jenny Mara for her early involvement in this issue. I recall attending the launch of the EHRC report on human trafficking in Scotland back, I think, in late 2011, when the Labour peer Baroness Kennedy stressed the potential for Scotland to be a leader in tackling human trafficking. So I'm pleased that we have got to where we are today. And last month, with Jenny Mara and Christina McKelvey, I was fortunate to attend a summit held in this Parliament, but attended by representatives from prosecuting authorities, not only from England and Wales and Northern Ireland, but also the Republic of Ireland, which was a first, because collaboration across borders will more effectively help to combat the scourge that is human trafficking. One thing that came out strongly from that summit was the value of the European arrest warrant. So I am pleased that the argument in respect to that seems to have been won down south, notwithstanding the best efforts of the Tory right. But it is, of course, important that this legislation ensures that the victims of trafficking are properly supported through what can be a very stressful judicial system. And accordingly, I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to enhancing the rights of victims, and I hope that plays a central part in the bill. I also welcome the government's commitment to tackling another scourge, that of revenge porn, which Alec Neil referred to earlier today. Presiding officer, 1964 was, of course, a significant year. Just over 50 years ago, The Sun emerged as a newspaper from the ashes of the Daily, Mirror, the Daily Herald sorry, in its pre-Murdoch phase. A general election had taken place in October that year, which emerged with a small Labour majority. And Teddy Taylor even managed to win Glasgow Cathcart for the Tories. And, of course, a piece of legislation called the Succession Scotland Act had been passed a few months before. This, of course, remains the definitive piece of legislation on wills and estates in Scotland. Society in Scotland has, of course, changed significantly since then, as was recognised by the Scottish Law Commission in their report on the subject in 2009. 
Some of their proposals remain significantly controversial, and while I welcome the Government's commitment to legislate on a number of technical aspects, such as closing a number of jurisdictional gaps, and in particular clarifying the effect of divorce, disillusion or annulment on the birth of a child on the will, I would hope that before too long we will, as a Parliament, take forward legislation to bring our succession law up to date and to make it fit for purpose in the 21st century. Fatal Accident Inquiries Bill is also a positive step forward, hopefully implementing the remaining recommendations of Lord Cullen and modernising the way fatal accident inquiries are held in Scotland. A Community Justice Bill will obviously need careful consideration, building on the need to ensure the balance of outcomes nationally and locally. Presiding Officer, one issue that did not feature very heavily in yesterday's debate, which, but which I believe still merits further discussion, is the introduction of Clare's Law. I'm certain that many of us will watch the progress of the six-month trial in Ayrshire and Aberdeen with some interest. And I echo Sandra White's comments that hopefully this pilot scheme can uh, lead to something more substantial throughout the rest of the country. Final minute. Presiding Officer, the introduction of proposals to protect victims of domestic violence is is also to be welcomed. Like human trafficking, it's evidence of a government and a parliament prioritising protection of those who need it most. Earlier today, we heard, and indeed from Jenny Mara, the opposition benches talk about the spirit of consensus. I hope they are able to live up to this and cooperate with the Scottish Government wherever possible, whilst recognising that some of these bills in the programme for government are controversial, not least amongst the Conservatives in relation to land reform. But I welcome the debate on that. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. I now call Mary Scanlon to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I welcome the First Minister and indeed the Deputy First Minister, John Swinney, uh, to their posts. And can I even more so welcome the tone adopted by the First Minister so far? It is a pity that it hasn't quite reached the back benches, but we do live in hope. Uh, but I hope it will continue for the sake of this Parliament as a respectful democratic debating yes. chamber yes. and not a place where opposition MSPs raise serious issues week after week and are then ridiculed and humiliated on the basis of their party's position in the latest polls, accused of scaremongering, accused of talking down Scotland, accused of talking down the NHS and public services, only to be finished with, well, things are much worse in England, and how much uh, uh, out of favour their party is compared to the SNP. That's not the Scotland we want. And I give an example, presiding officer. Week after week, along with many others, I sat here and listened to Jackie Bailey raising concerns, genuine concerns, over the veil of leave-in. And everything I've just said applied there. And far be it from me to say it about a Labour member, but we've all been there. Even the local newspaper raised concerns. And now that Lord Maclean has reported, he's suddenly being listened to. Well, I hope in future with this new First Minister there will be a little bit of respect and that we don't know, I certainly not, and we don't have to bring in Lord Maclean or the Member said she's in not order for me. the democratic views of people to be listened to. I've never liked bullies, and I may start submitting First Minister's questions again, given the business-like professional approach of the First Minister so far. And it's only right to acknowledge the work of all parties on the Smith Commission with full agreement and no footnotes of dissent. And indeed, the Scottish Conservative Strathclyde Commission, as well as my own party leader, who played her part. Ruth Davidson always favoured devolution of air passenger duty. And yes, she stuck her neck out. And I'm proud to say that it was the Tories who published the most far-reaching thoroughly thought through radical plans for further devolution in this Parliament in May this year. And now we have the next step, and I look forward to more to come. I welcome the devolution of power to the islands, as well as the appointment of Derek Mackay, a minister widely respected by councils and particularly island councils across Scotland. And I also welcome the work of the island leaders, such as Gary Robinson, and Malcolm Bell in Shetland, as well as Western Isles and Orkney. But in the short time I have, and if the SNP are truly to be a listening government, they need to start listening to patients. Patients with mental health issues. This Parliament has not achieved the progress we all hoped for in passing the 2003 Bill with nearly 3,000 amendments at Stage 2. Uh, 
And, and I would just say, John Finney, when he was in the SNP, John and I met two managers at the psychiatric hospital in uh, Inverness. And all I can say is when we left, I turned to John and I said, well, if that's how the managers talk to elected members of parliament, God help the patients. So we've got a long way to go. But the SNP, as they've said, are unlikely to listen to lairds and landowners. That's their right. But I only hope that they'll listen to the gamekeepers. The gamekeepers and the stalkers, they know what it is to live off the land and live in the country. They know how much their livelihoods, local villages, local schools, the sustainability of small communities depend on the effective management of estates. And as the daughter of a farm labourer, I'm hardly going to be number one in the queue supporting the Lairds and probably far closer to the, the gamekeepers. And while additional funds have been allocated to bed blocking in A&E, this isn't the full answer. Alec Neil knew that. The government needs to understand why we've got queues at A&E. There's queues and thousands and thousands more people going to A&E because they can't get to see their doctor. So don't just put the money at A&E. Let's try and understand the problems uh, before uh, looking for a solution. And on bed blocking, Shona Robinson said this morning, oh, when we have health and social care integrated, all will be well. It won't. NHS Highland and the Highland Council, we've the been integrated for last two minute. years. And we've still got bed blocking. Care homes are embargoed due to poor, poor care inspectorate reports. I visited a new care home in Russia last week to be told they get three inquiries a day for people to go there. So in order to er eradicate uh, bed blocking, let's try and understand the main issues. The government also uh, mentions the living wage and increase in childcare are significant uh, policies for the programme for government. In the statutory guidance on how the living wage will be taken into account on public contracts. So I hope when they look at the public contracts to councils and to care homes, they will look at what child care staff, home carers and care homes are paid to provide their policies. Please, because Dr. Close. Uh, I will close. Uh, uh, I know that Mark Macdonald thinks that all the care home providers, nurseries, etc., are languishing in high profits. But I think we need to look at how we are funding them first. And there's a huge variety of funding before we start criticising them. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Macdonald be followed by Neil Bebby. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I've got a lot to get through, so I won't bother with the fact that Mary Scanlon has taken me out of context, because, frankly, I could deal with most of her speech as being quite gratuitously out of context throughout. But this is a programme for a government, Presiding Officer, which has social justice running through its core and at its very heart, and is built on the principles that we want to establish of seeing fairness and prosperity as two sides of the same coin. In order to redistribute wealth, you need to also create wealth in the first place, and that is something this government is acutely aware of. And this programme for government built on progressive policy approaches taken by this government in other areas, whether it's through the cancellation of right to buy, which has enabled house building by councils yet again after many, many decades in which council houses were sold off at uh, discounts which made it uneconomical to build new council houses, something which regrettably the Labour Party did absolutely nothing about during the time that they spent in office at both Westminster and in Scotland. They introduced pressured area status, but they did not allow for the removal of the right to buy something which it took an SNP government to deliver. And to, I want to look also at two other policies, the land and buildings transaction tax which again has redressed things away from those uh, trying to get on to the property ladder for the very first time, because we accept that there has to be a balance between the renting and the purchasing, and also the living wage policy, which I'm pleased to see is being taken further by the government, and also the additional funding that is being allocated to the Poverty Alliance to bring forward the accreditation programme there. I welcome the establishment of the Commission uh, on Local Government Finance, as recommended by the Local Government and Regeneration Committee. Uh, I'm pleased to hear again Alec Rowley welcoming it in the Chamber today. It didn't seem to be met with quite such a strong welcome from the Labour front bench yesterday, 
who seemed to think that, the, that they didn't want to be involved in discussions and constructive discussions about local government finance. I hope they will revisit that approach. Can I say, presiding officer, as, a, a, as uh, somebody who is a parent of a child with additional support needs and who has campaigned on the issue, I'm uh, very excited about the prospect uh, of uh, new rights for children with additional support needs in the forthcoming education legislation. And I'll be very interested to see what those are, what they, what they entail, and how they will be, will be delivered. And I'll, although I will not be uh, a member of the committee which will be scrutinising that legislation, it will be a section of that legislation that I will take a very keen interest in. And I'll be very interested to see what external bodies have to say. Of course, through the Scottish strategy for autism, um, this government has shown that it has uh, taken a strong uh, approach in relation to additional support needs and also through the Keys for Life Learning Disability Strategy, another um, important piece of work being taken forward by the Scottish Government. So enshrining some of that work uh, and some of those approaches in rights through legislation I think will be very exciting and it's something I look forward to seeing happen. I also, in terms of the education agenda, look forward to the, um, the work around attainment and literacy. And I, I was struck uh, during Liz Smith's, Liz Smith's contribution that on the one hand recently in this parliament she came to this chamber and made a statement, a statement which I don't agree with, that there are failing schools in Scotland. Now she's open to have that position, I disagree with it, but if she holds that position I don't see how she can uh, hold that position and then take a, take a view against the establishment of attainment officers in local authorities. Surely if she holds the view that there are schools out there that are failing, she should welcome support being put in. I think that support is necessary, even though I don't agree, I'll, just one second, even though I don't agree with her, pro, with her diagnosis, I think that there are still issues in some of our most deprived communities that these attainment officers will need to take a closer look at. I think leaving the burden solely with directors of education runs the risk of, of, of losing some of that potential hands-on approach that could be taken through the appointment of attainment officers. I'll happily let Liz Smith. Uh, thank you uh, for taking the intervention. I didn't say that I was entirely against them. I said I needed to be persuaded, and I was looking for more details about the exact role that they would have in relation to those for directors of education and how they, uh, that attainment improvement would be actually measured. That's what I said. Mark McDonald. I'm, I'm happy to, to take that as, as, as Liz Smith's position, and I hope that she will find herself persuaded, because I think that, coupled with the, uh, the drive on literacy and numeracy, specifically focused uh, in deprived communities, uh, some of those uh, schools will be schools in my constituency, and I look forward to, again, uh, examining more closely the detail. But certainly, at the outset, I think both of these proposals ha carry uh, substantial Substantial merit and are ones which should be welcomed. The last thing I want to touch on, uh, Presiding Officer, is the, uh, the legislative proposals that will come forward regarding domestic abuse. And I, think that is, I think that is something that uh, is extremely welcome. I, I'm, I'm very pleased at the piloting of Clare's Law in Aberdeen. I'll be interested to see how that progresses and hopefully it will then uh, be rolled out across Scotland. Uh, beyond that, I think that we do need to take a much stronger focus uh, on domestic abuse in society. It simply cannot be right that in this day and age there are still far too many uh, individuals who are falling victim to domestic abuse. And one thing I would just put on, on the record as, as saying is that as well as the physical element of domestic abuse, we must also have acknowledgement of the psychological abuse that can take place, which can be just as damaging and can cause uh, great harm to the individuals who find themselves on the receiving end of that psychological abuse. So I hope when the legislation is brought forward, I understand that psychological abuse may prove to be more difficult to prove than uh, physical abuse. Uh, nonetheless, I think it would be worth uh, having cognizance of that. My apologies. I can only offer the last two speakers five and a half minutes. Neil Bibby to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, President Officer. As members have said, the constitutional debate has dominated uh, our time in, in the Chamber for uh, over the last three years. And what is important now is that we focus on how we help people and our communities that we represent. President Officer, I welcome much of Nicola Sturgeon's speech yesterday and uh, what was in the legislative programme. I believe action uh, on issues like domestic violence and human trafficking that Jenny Mara has raised are, are particularly welcome. I also welcome Nicola Sturgeon's plea for uh, constructive suggestions from opposition parties on what we can work on together, and I will happily take her up on that offer. 
Um, that, however, will not stop us challenging the government to deliver action, and I do believe there are some clear omissions from the programme that my constituents and communities would want to see. Uh, for example, on this side of the chamber, as James Kelly and Malcolm Chisholm um, have said, we would like to have seen measures to address the serious issues in the private rent sector. Action needed because earlier this month the government's private uh, rent sector statistics showed that in parts of Scotland average rents have risen by a staggering 40 per cent in four years, well above inflation. I know from speaking to constituents uh, that many people are forced to spend half their monthly pay on private rent, so it will be disappointed to hundreds of thousands of tenants who rent in the private sector that this government has not chosen to create a system that works better for those tenants. And as Alan jo Alison Johnston from the, the Greens highlighted yesterday, the issue of better bus regulation is something that this government uh, continues to ignore. The government should be supporting my colleague Ian Gray to ensure the public are at the heart of our public transport system and efforts are made to stop bus passengers paying more and getting less. But it's on the issue of education I want to focus on uh, this afternoon, President Officer. To be fair to the First Minister, she did put a considerable emphasis on education in her speech. Uh, no one can doubt the importance of education improving our children's life chances, but equally, no one should doubt the huge challenges there are currently in our education system. Uh, like Liz Smith, however, I must dispute the First Minister's assertion made yesterday when she said every main measure showed our education is improving. As Liz Smith said, that is simply not true. There have been marginal improvements in a number of areas, so there should be. Um, I think we would expect that as a minimum, given this government has been in power for seven and a half years. But the reality is, in areas like numeracy, standards are actually falling. Scottish Government statistics published this year show a marked drop in the proportion of children who are performing well or very well in numeracy at primary school and showed no improvement at S2 level. I would have thought our children's ability to count would be counted as a main measure of educational uh, achievement. But it's not just numeracy that we need to improve on. On literacy, as my colleague Kezia Dugdale raised at First Minister's questions today, statistics from Save the Children show that one in five children from poor families leave primary school unable to read well, a level four times as high as pupils from better off households. There are, of course, lots of ideas on how we best improve attainment, and we should have a full debate about that. But it's clear that literacy and numeracy and the early years are absolutely key. Um, on the topic of early years, this government still I don't have time, I'm, I'm afraid. Uh, this government still lags behind the rest of the UK when it comes to childcare for two year olds. But as Labour has said before, we want a childcare system not only with additional availability, but one that is affordable, flexible and of high quality. Uh, part of the proposal for a, an education bill includes uh, the promotion of Gaelic. As someone who has family in the Western Isles, uh, I'm a keen supporter of Gaelic and the importance it plays, particularly in those communities. Uh, as for the education bill, more generally, it will be for local government and teaching unions to assess the workability of proposals affecting uh, the education system at a local level that come forward amid concerns of a workload crisis, particularly amongst teachers. In terms of higher education, President Officer, I absolutely support uh, the aspiration to widen access. There is uh, also a real need for more children from deprived backgrounds to have the opportunity to go to university. We have 3,500 fewer entrants to university from the most deprived areas now compared to 2007. So I welcome the impact for access fund and the ambition expressed to widen in access. The First Minister yesterday talked about this in, in the context of a child born uh, today, or, or in that case yesterday. I would hope that the, we do not have to wait 18 uh, years to see serious progress in widening access, and I look forward to seeing the clear, mind, uh, the clear milestones uh, that have been promised in relation to that. And I hope the Government will also listen to Labour's call uh, to revisit the decision to cut bursaries for the poorest students. If social justice is meant to be uh, a mainstay of the Scottish Government's agenda, then they will revisit that. They will also revisit uh, and look again at their approach to colleges and further education. Part-time courses, as has been mentioned today, uh, have been Mr. slashed Jones, by this Government. 
facilities, and it is vital in getting people uh, back into work and allowing people to gain uh, further qualifications. Uh, of course, we will uh, work with university staff and students, uh, and, and it is important that their views are taken on board in, in relation to the Higher Education Governance Bill. I know there is a consultation on that ends in January, and um, we have to listen to all the stakeholders in regard to that bill. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Bob Doris, after which we move to closing speeches. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, in the time I have here this afternoon, I want to make some comments on the one-year programme for government, but also, if time allows, talk about what I see within this programme. It's not been really a one-year event, but a programme reaching towards 2020 and beyond, and a vision for Scotland. But I want to do some of the specific scrutiny of some of the legislation that will be presented to this Parliament. On fatal accident inquiries, I am delighted the Scottish Government has included uh, the provision to have FAIs into overseas deaths. That is something myself and campaigner Julie Love, uh, one of my constituents who started a charity, Dana, uh, called for in the Cullen consultation on it, and the Government has um, agreed to put that in the primary legislation. Uh, three notes of caution. I am sorry, Patricia, I just do not have the time. Three notes of caution in relation to that. The, the Lord Advocate has to have criteria by which to decide to use discretionary powers for a fatal accident inquiry. So we have to look at things such as family statements of the bereaved individuals, eh, post-mortems perhaps in many, many cases to get the evidence to see if an FAI is needed, and looking at some of the local police reports perhaps. We need to know the criteria by which the Lord Advocate decides to have a fatal accident inquiry into overseas deaths. In terms of the human trafficking bill, and I pay credit to members across the chamber who have sought to deliver on, on this, um, I just hosted an event in relation to allegations of forced organ harvesting in China. In fact, I do not think I have to use the word allegations. I could probably have uh, dismissed with that. Um, and in relation to the human trafficking of uh, organs of prisoners of conscience, particularly Falun Gong and others. And I am just wondering if there is scope within the human trafficking bill in order to uh, beef up the, the, and criminalise those that are involved in the trade of illegal organ harvesting um, to the UK and to Scotland. I know that is not the main vehicle of this bill, but it might be an opportunity to shine a light on that and see what Scotland and the UK indeed can do. In relation to the Community Empowerment Bill, uh, I am delighted that is ongoing. I would draw attention to what I would like to call the urban right to buy, which I think is vitally important. And it will be really quite important to look at what we mean by neglected and disused land or properties. And that might very well mean much more compulsory purchase, quite frankly, across public and private sector. And I think um, local authorities in particular have to show a planned vision for community assets going forward, rather than wait to become neglected and then pass a liability rather than an asset on to the community. And we have to look at that in more detail. I am also delighted that community planning partnerships will get more powers over community justice disposal, £100 million pounds will be used for that. But I suppose we have to make sure all the stakeholders in community planning partnerships, including the communities themselves, are directly involved in that to make sure they shape what community justice will look like for those who have perpetrated within their communities. I would also like to support the, uh, the new Empowering Communities Fund. And the People and Communities Fund was excellent, quite often filtered through housing associations, and they do a tremendous job. But I think it is quite important that local organisations and local individuals can now apply for that expanded fund, expanded by £10 million, putting more money into individuals and groups' hands. And I think that is very important as well. Much to be welcomed in terms of equality and social justice. I am delighted the, social, the Scottish Welfare Fund will be placed in a statutory footing, should uh, this Scottish Government's commitment to how we help the most vulnerable people in society, and our extension of our living wage policy in £200,000 additional pounds for the Poverty Alliance to double and beyond the amount of um, businesses uh, um, who are delivering on the living wage for their employees. Uh, a question I would have for government, how we promote the very smallest businesses in our communities, the people that work in local shops and, uh, and businesses, uh, one, uh, employers who employ one or two people where it is a huge percentage of their business cost paying the living wage. They should, of course, pay the living wage, but how do we help promote that? James, I am sorry, I just do not have time given the time that we have. So I have given some ideas on how I think we can improve the business of government. But the vision thing, I will just have to run through some of the initiatives. These aren't just a cluster of policies that the Scottish Government has. So if we look at a young person, we see the family nurse partnerships for our, most, for our mothers before even they are with child. Uh, we see the radical expansion of childcare from 16 hours to 30 hours, which I very much welcome. We see free school meals, primary one to primary three. We see a huge literacy and numeracy drive 
primary one to primary three. We see attainment officers appointed by Education Scotland and to every local authority to drive up attainment across the boards. When young people leave school, we're going to see 30,000 apprenticeships, much more of them taken by women, and huge success in outcome rates in relation to that for young people in Scotland. I very much welcome that as well. We see a new youth employment fund of £16.6 million to deal with issues of segregation in workplaces, including women and disabled people and ethnic minorities for young people as they enter the employment market. And that's vital as well. We get to universities and we see a wider access fund and we see minimum income guarantees for the poorest students. Sit that beside our commitments on equality measures in the living wage. We see so much a common thread of equality and justice running through this entire programme for government. I should say, presiding officer, of close, course please. we could do so much more in the last 10 seconds in relation to the minimum wage, tax credits particularly for women, national insurance and tax thresholds to make this an even fairer programme for government, but we need the powers to achieve that. Hey, thanks. And we now move to closing speeches and I call on Jean Urquhart. Six minutes, please. Thank you, uh, presiding officer. Um, yesterday, the, the First Minister gave some detail in an overview of her government's programme for the next year. And her ambition for participation, prosperity and fairness are all easily endorsed um, by the Indy Green Group members. Um, on democracy, we are delighted that there is a commitment to further encourage the kind of political engagement that became quite overwhelming uh, during the referendum campaign. And we endorse the proposal of the government uh, for more public discussions to be held around the country to better understand local problems and assist local communities uh, to be in charge of finding solutions and making, making uh, results possible. This chimes totally with the creation of a commission to find a fair alternative to the council tax, which was never fair, nor relevant, nor understood. Um, and uh, uh, really has come to the end of time. And I, uh, the, the, the criticism of the Scottish Government for maintaining the freeze on the council tax, I think, is, is uh, wholly unfounded. I mean, the, the statement was that it would, it would remain frozen until a much fairer tax could be found, and that's very welcome. All of this uh, speaks of being at once more inclusive and prepared to devolve power where communities are ready uh, to take responsibility. Reinventing the island's working group gives more evidence to the local empowerment being taken seriously with the chance uh, then that there are issue, issues whose time, has, uh, whose time has come. Presiding officer land reform is 400 years overdue. Um, and so the potential for these ambitions will see a Scotland that has a massive appeal and is full of, of potential. But I think it's important that we recognise that in all of that uh, inclusivity and wanting to cover the whole of Scotland, not to be remote, to be government that's close uh, and fair and willing to work with opposition parties, whoever has the best ideas, there are some issues that remain uh, absent from the First Minister's uh, paper. And I think an example is Neil Finlay's uh, bill. That was something which the, the government, uh, the lobby, the potential for a lobbying bill, the government did declare that it, it would take that uh, to its heart and to look at that. And it's, I don't know where it is, it's, it's become lost in recent months. Um, and as my, my colleague Alison Johnson mentioned yesterday in her response, there are some other notable gaps. Climate change is now a, 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 real, a reality and a dramatic response to our society for too long, ignoring all the obvious signs. And the Scottish Government has been revered for the targets it has set, but the years pass without meeting them. This needs attention, and I think we... we uh, do no good uh, by ignoring it any longer. And the one, the, the big issue that I feel is missing is, is housing and fuel poverty. I mean, uh, to ask the government to continue a pace and to increase the retrofit and insulation programmes that it has started and that have benefited so many people, but we need to step this up. Energy efficiency and conservation is a, is a 
as important as energy production. And I do believe that the Scottish Parliament could lead by example even in this building. Housing is still key, and certainly in the area that, that I represent um, and in urban all over Scotland, people uh, leave for various reasons, but mostly they leave because they have nowhere to live. People who want to come to live in an area can't come because they don't have anywhere to live. So it's, it's, it's an issue that is, I think, at the heart of all of these other ambitions that the Scottish Government has. I, the, um, all of the statements made about, about business in Scotland I welcome too, and I think has given a very good steer to business in Scotland. And, and the help that we have seen for thousands of small businesses, and we have to remember that in Scotland we have more small businesses than any other part of the United Kingdom. They do make up, they collectively employ more people than any of the larger businesses, and they do need to be kept on board. And I think this government has been seen to be fair, to be helpful, and to really respect the work that they do. And I welcome the Fair Work Convention. And I, I'm sorry that the Smith Commission, for, for all that it has declared, but one of its great faults, I think, is omitting to give the Scottish Government the right to set a minimum wage. It's fundamental to the kind of development of prosperity that we Could might have seen in this course, country. Please? And we might have given up many other things that are in the Smith Commission if to have that power to help people in poverty in this country. Thank you. Thanks very much. I now call on Jim Hume. Six minutes, please, Mr Hume. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As uh, Willie Rennie and, of course, Alison McInnes have said, there is much in this programme that we can broadly agree on, and I welcome the spirit of cross-party cooperation that I, I hope this government is serious about. Working constructively is important in achieving common goals, and I, of course, welcome the First Minister's announcement of £5 million match funded to £15 million to tackle the problem of delayed discharges. However, it's equally important to stand up and hold the government to account. Uh, to put the size of the problem in context, from July to September this year, uh, over 154,500 bed days were occupied by delayed discharge pa patients. That's up from 126,500 during the same time last year. In the October 2014 census, 321 patients were delayed over four weeks, despite being clinically ready to leave hospital up from 156 uh, at the same time last year. All, I've just, sorry, I, don't, I really don't have time. Apologies uh, to Bob Doris. Almost three quarters of bed days occupied by delayed discharges were by patients aged 75 and over. The coming at a time when boarding is reported to have soared to 3,000 patients, geriatric beds have been capped by a third since 2010, and emergency admissions for older people at their highest in a decade. With all that in mind, we must look carefully at the Scottish Government's plans to integrate health and social care. Whilst the Scottish Lib Dems support moves, of course, to treat more people in their own settings, ministers are only bottlenecking our hospitals by cutting beds without subsequently increasing community care first. A long-lasting policy is needed to tackle this issue in a meaningful, meaningful way. And whilst I'm pleased that the First Minister has earmarked delayed discharges as a priority area for government, there needs to be a specific long-term action plan in place to deal with bed shortages and workforce issues, beyond measures contained in the Accident and Emergency Plan published last year. Deputy Presiding Officer, as Willie Rennie and uh, Mary Scanley, Scanlon uh, passionately alluded to, we know that one in four people are likely to suffer from mental health problems at some point in their lives. Figures published recently showed one in five patient, patients face waiting, or, waitings of over 18 weeks to start treatment for psychological therapies. That's not good enough. 81.3% of patients were treated within 18 weeks, which falls way below the Scottish Government's heat target for 90% of patients to be treated by 18 weeks by December this year. The RCN Scotland highlighted a 17% fall in the number of staffed mental health beds across Scotland since 2010, and it also found that the NHS in Scotland 
lost 64 mental health nurses. RCN Scotland, SAMH and other charities have warned about the lack of specialist nurses, beds and support in the community for mental health services. Given that one in four people will experience a mental health problem through their lifetime, our NHS uh, should reflect that, of course. And there are problems for our young people who are facing long waits to be begin treatment at mental health services. Too many wait months to ac access treatment. That's indefensible for a young person at such an important time in their lives. There are 883 fewer mental he health beds since 2009. The average waiting time is eight, mo eight months. Scotland deserves better. Eight months is an acceptable waiting time for a young person at such an important time in their lives. We wouldn't ex expect a child to limp on with a broken leg for that long. Why should we allow a young person to continue with untreated mental health problems? Getting the right combination of public mental health, anti-stigma, timely access to therapy and reliable crisis and emergency care will all be part of tackling delays in our mental health services. I am proud that Lib Dems, as part of the UK Coalition Government, have written into law that for the first time ever, mental health and physical health will receive equal recognition. Scottish Lib Dems will be urging the new Health Secretary to enshrine pa uh, parity in law here also between the treatment of mental and physical ill health. This step would put fairness at the heart of the new First Minister's legislative programme. Deputy Presiding Officer, yesterday, yesterday Willie Rennie pressed the First Minister about my bill proposal to ban smoking in cars with children present, a proposal which I launched last spring, consulted on last summer, which did not just receive cross-party uh, support, but received all party support, and during that consultation process received overwhelming support, with even the tobacco industry stating that adults should not smoke in the enclosed environment of a car with children present. We know from the evidence that as many as 60,000 children are exposed to secondhand smoke in cars, not every year, but every week in Scotland. I realise that the government has decided to consult on their own tobacco measures, including smoking with children in cars, but the government's consultation does not finish until early next year. We can act faster. My bill is ready to go now. Rather than waiting for the long process of the government's much wider public health bill to progress, and in the spirit, of course, of consensual government that the First Minister has mentioned uh, so much and in, an or, in her own words, uh, with shared endeavour, I wonder if will today the Deputy First Minister confirm in his summing up that his government will support my bill now to protect those vulnerable young lungs still being exposed to such damaging second-hand smoke in cars? Gosh, on Thank you so much. I now call on Gavin Brown. Eight minutes, Mr Brown. Deputy Presiding Officer, thank you very much. Well, we waited about two and a half months longer than we have to wait for a programme for government. We had a vacuum of two and a half months, and so I think most of us were probably expecting something bold, yep. innovative, yep. radical, that was actually going to be worth the wait. But I have to say, listening carefully to the First Minister's speech yesterday, listening carefully to the debate since then, it was all just a bit flat. It just felt a bit flat. Now, the SNP members, to be fair to them, have done their very best over the course of two days to talk it up. But at the end of the day, they've dressed it up as something really a bit more than it actually was. There was very happy to, to give way to Mr uh, McMillan. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you very much, Gavin, for taking the intervention. Uh, just following on from Gavin's comments, sir, does he suggest that, uh, that voting for 16 and 17 year olds is actually not worth it? And that's a bit flat. Brown? Presiding officer, I noticed he didn't challenge the overall uh, uh, part of the, the programme for government, that, uh, that overall, looking at it, it was a, it was a bit flat and not really uh, something that uh, I think the country will get hugely excited about. But to take him on on his point, I mean, as Ruth Davidson, I think, uh, articulately mentioned in her response to it yesterday, there are elements of it clearly that we will support. And 16 and 17-year-old votes for uh, elections is something that she clearly pledged yesterday. And yes, that's something that we do support. But I don't think it was huge news in terms of a programme for government that came out yesterday. 
We also, I think, clearly articulated that we were uh, in favour of Clare's Law, again, something that Ruth Davidson had pressed the First Minister on at FMQs. Uh, we support the uh, bill to combat human trafficking, and we support, again, the uh, measures to try and combat domestic abuse. So there's, of course, a number of areas in there we would positively endorse. A couple of bills that uh, I suspect we'll probably happily support uh, without massive enthusiasm. And, of course, uh, one or two in particular we would clearly uh, argue against, land reform being one, which I think, again, was articulated pretty strongly uh, by Murdo Fraser. But let us, let us look at some of the, the key issues that I think really actually do need to be tackled, because the point has been made by a number of speakers, but it is really important that we start to think th about the powers we do have, Here. and we start to utilise the powers that we do have. Absolutely. Yes, we all know that the SNP want independence, but there is still a time to go until uh, March or April of 2016 for the next election. There is an enormous amount of work to be done with the powers that we have. There's a lot that could be, a lot that could be done with the powers we have, whether that is in health, education, justice or the economy. Now, my party, I think, has focused pretty heavily on its response in education, an area we are passionate about, an area we published a collection of uh, essays about just a couple of weeks ago. And I think it's here where the government really could do more. I'll start with the, the issue raised again by Liz Smith about the uh, discrimination against those born in certain months of the year. But I, I think it's a serious issue. I think it's one that has been argued, I think, very intelligently uh, by Liz Smith, by, I think, Reform Scotland and others too. Because everybody in this chamber must agree that at age three and age four are critical times in any person's life. A time when you're absorbing information, a time when development is happening day by day, and a time of your life that must have an impact probably for the rest of your life. So somebody getting six terms of preschool education, all other things being equal, must have a greater prospect than somebody having five terms of preschool education. And again, somebody having five terms of preschool education must have a greater prospect than somebody having only four terms of preschool education. The difference between six terms and four terms at that age must have an impact. And while there, uh, the, uh, in just a moment, while there uh, are probably a number of ways of dealing with it, I think firstly the government should acknowledge it as an issue and let's try to work together to get something to do to resolve it because it's been argued intelligently and I think it is a potentially uh, major issue. I want to give way to, I think it was Fiona McLeod. Fiona McLeod. Thank you, Mr Brown. As the mother of a November child, um, you, I, I am acutely aware 24 years ago um, that the development of a child at that stage is hugely different between a four and a half year old, sorry, a two and a half year old and a three year old. So going to nursery at the age of three is when you get the most benefit out of your four terms not, and getting six terms would not give you the benefit that it, you, you're looking for. We, we may have to just to, to, to agree to disagree on that point. I, I'm convinced that somebody getting six terms of preschool education is autom not automatically, but on the balance of probability, in a better position than somebody uh, getting, getting four terms. We'll just have to uh, disagree, I guess, on that point. Um, in terms of other educational points, I think it's important that more action is taken for colleges, because it's not just full-time courses that matter. Of course, full-time full courses matter, but part-time courses matter too. And a number of members have, I think, very articulately pointed out the sheer number of people that rely on part-time courses. And there is a huge constituency of our economy and our electorate that cannot do full-time courses. Yep. They have to rely on part-time courses as a way of improving their life, as a way of improving their prospects. And it's quite wrong to only include, include full-time places to the detriment of part-time places. Deputy Presiding Officer, we welcome uh, the additional nursery hours. I think all parts of the Chamber do. But I just caution by saying this. It's really important that it, this is delivered by the government because when they came into power in 2007, they had the 600 hours pledge. It was in a document entitled First Steps. It was one of the first things they said they were going to do. But it took seven years for us to get to that position. So while we welcome the announcement, it's critical that it actually happens on the ground. The other area we wanted to touch on was the government's response uh, in terms of the economy. Once again, lip service is given a huge amount in, in the uh, document talking about the economy. But when you turn to the pages looking for business, looking for the economy, it's pretty thin mm. indeed. 
The small business bonus is re-announced. Now, we welcome this commitment. It was uh, our policy, too, right at the very start. We worked with the government to make sure that it actually happened. Um, but it is not a fresh initiative. Yep. There was very little fresh in there. The one thing that was actually a new announcement, and I am glad that John Swinney is responding uh, on behalf of the government to this, because the big idea announced yesterday, said with a straight face, was that we were going to bring in the Scottish Business Development Bank. Now, presenting officer, when it was first announced in March of 2013, we welcomed the Scottish Business Development Bank. When it was re-announced in September 2013, we welcomed again the Scottish Business Development Bank. When it was scrapped in March of this year, we were saddened by the fact that it was scrapped and we called the government to task on it. When it was re-announced in August as part of the independence package and we were told it could only happen if we were independent, we welcomed the announcement of it, but obviously didn't want independence. So we're told it couldn't happen. So for the fourth time, <laughs> Deputy <laughs> Presiding Officer, can I welcome the Scottish Business Development Bank and say that I hope it is fourth time lucky uh, on behalf uh, from Thank our party. I hope close. the government delivers this time around. A very grateful Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. Many thanks. Now Colin James Kelly. Twelve minutes, Mr Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I welcome the opportunity to close this afternoon's debate on behalf of the Labour Party. And can I start off on a consensual note by um, yes, <laughs> I do I do consensus uh, by congratulating the First Minister Nicola Sturgeon and also the Deputy First Minister John Swinney and welcoming them uh, to their positions and wishing them well. I think uh, we heard much rhetoric yesterday from, the de from uh, Nicola Sturgeon, the, the First Minister. I think the key to whether that rhetoric will become a reality is whether the government understands the situation that is happening on the ground in Scotland's communities and therefore, if they do understand it, they may, they may then be able to bring forward the policies that are able to deliver change. Because if you look and many members have noted this. If you look at the education sector and the issues that we face with access, particularly as a result of the 140,000 uh, college places that have been axed uh, since 2007, there's a real challenge there. On health, you only need to travel from Bearsden to Shettleson, where for every mile you travel, the life expectancy de decreases by a year. Those show real issues that have got to be tackled in, those, in, in the communities as you move towards Shettleson. And on low pay, we have 400,000 people who are not on the living wage, including 64% uh, who are women. So there, there are substantial issues that the government uh, have got to... Let me take Mr Neil first of all. Thank you. Thank you I thank the member for taking the intervention. Will he join with me in urging councils like North Lanarkshire Council now to finally settle the many thousands of equal pay claims that so far they have totally resisted and spent a fortune in lawyers' fees fighting against? Ms Kelly. I think that in terms of tackling low pay, what we want to see is we want to see leadership from the SNP government. And the ranks, the, ranks, the ranks of the SNP group there have voted against the living wage five times. Five times, let me make progress. Five times in the progress, in the process of this parliament. You've, you've shunned the opportunity to give a pay rise to the 64% of women who are on the living wage. Five times you have voted that down. Let me, let me talk uh, about the, the programme and welcome some aspects of the programme. Uh, first of all, let me acknowledge the, the government bringing forward the human trafficking legislation, which Jenny Mara uh, has done so much work to support and also the fatal accident inquiry bill uh, piloted or brought forward by Patricia Ferguson. Uh, I do regret that we saw no sight in the statement of progress in terms of the lobbying legislation, which Neil Finlay uh, had sponsored 
And I think that is to the detriment of the Parliament if we don't have legislation like that that brings about more transparency. Uh, I want to welcome the statement from Nicola Sturgeon in terms of extending the franchise for 16 and 17 year olds. Uh, I think that's something that has been welcomed across the, the board. Uh, on land reform, we heard uh, from Claire Baker uh, you know, welcoming the legislation and we heard from Murdo Fraser expressing uh, some concerns. Uh, Labour have been at the forefront of you know, calling for the, the re-instigation of the Land Reform Review Group. And we look forward next week to the publishing of the policy and intent from that review group, including examination of the 62 proposals. I think the objectives of land reform and extending the ownership of more land into communities is very much a worthwhile one. And uh, if the government sets out uh, it's stalled properly. I think it's something that we can work together with them on. In relation to the council tax uh, consultation review, um, you know, I want to make a couple of points. I think, first of all, in terms of the time scale, it's 10 weeks today since the referendum. So the Smith Commission, you know, announced actually 10 weeks uh, tomorrow. Uh, it's taken 10 weeks to get through that enormous amount of work and produce uh, a substantial report today. You, would, you then wonder why is it in terms of the council tax consultation that it's not been set up until early in the new year and it's not going to report until next autumn, almost a full year from now. I mean, that strikes me that it's not just a case of kicking the issue into the long grass. It's almost a case that it's been lobbed all the way into the woods. Surely you must be concerned about that, Mr Macdonald. Mark Macdonald. I think the important thing with this commission is to ensure that it gets things right, and that's the important aspect of it. But I wonder if Mr Kelly heard his colleague Alec Rowley welcoming the establishment of the commission, and will he commit to the Labour Party fully engaging with that commission? Because it, it seemed uh, yesterday that the front bench of the Labour Party were uh, equivocating on that. James Kelly. We welcome the opportunity to engage with the Commission and we also welcome the opportunity to look at the funding of local government because the reality is that when the cuts have come down from Westminster, local government have been penalised. Thousands of local council workers have been piled onto the dole as a result of cuts passed down by this SNP government. So we welcome the opportunity to look at how local councils are funded, because currently they can only raise 20% uh, in their own local area, and that therefore gives, restricts their flexibility in, uh, in mitigating the cuts and the pain that are, that's handed down by this SNP government. In terms of, uh, in terms of health, um, you know, I very much welcome uh, Jackie Bailey's suggestion that what we need is a review of the NHS. Because it, it's, clear, it's clear that when you look at the NHS, the NHS is in crisis. We're failing to meet uh, waiting time targets, including the, the A&E targets of four hours and also the cancer waiting time targets. Only last night I got an email from a constituent who turned up at a hospital to have a cancer tumour removed, only to find they couldn't take them because there weren't enough beds. That's, you know, and it, doesn't, it doesn't fill me with any pleasure to have to tell the Chamber that. That's a real regret, and I'm sure uh, everyone agrees with that. But that, that is an example of the sort of crisis situations that the NHS are facing. And I think that what is needed is a proper review of what's happening uh, in the NHS, which then would allow us to move forward and make progress uh, on the issues. I think uh, in terms of the afternoon started with a contribution from Mr Neil, and I, I was very disappointed. There was little on it on housing. I think in fact, actual fact, he spent more time reading out all the new areas uh, in his portfolio, and he got so excited and carried away by that that he didn't concentrate on the issues that matter to people. There's no doubt that housing is in crisis in Scotland. Uh, the statistics earlier on this week show 
a 22%. No, no. I need to make progress. I need to make progress and I need to point out that there's been a 22% reduction, 22% reduction Mr. in social Stewart. housing. And that comes at a time when there's 155,000 people on housing waiting lists. Over 4,000 children are going to be homeless as we move towards Christmas. That is an absolute scandal in modern Scotland. And that is also compounded by the fact that we see a growth in the private rented sector uh, because people can't get on to the housing ladder. And figures out this week show that private rents in Scotland are running at £537 a month. They're rising faster than the rest of the UK. And yet we heard no action from Nicola Sturgeon in terms of a statement in relation to how that would be tackled. The Labour Party proposed earlier in the year to cap rent increases and also to extend tenancy, something that would help uh, tenants in the private rented sector. Again, that was voted down uh, by the SNP benches. We now have a consultation that is running, but we have no sign yet of legislation. And the result of that is that the people that suffer are those that are living in these private rented accommodations and having to endure extortionate rent rises and sometimes living in squalid accommodation. That is unacceptable and it's time that the government uh, acted on it. On education, uh, I note the points in the new bill in relation to an attainment uh, advisor. I think there are real problems around access and attainment. In the poorest districts of Glasgow, uh, kids only have a 1 in 10 chance of uh, reaching university. And I think the opportunity um, to extend access uh, is constrained by some of the education cuts that both Liz Smith and Ken McIntyre uh, spoke about. I think the situation that the Ken McIntosh, OK. I think the situation has moved on since the start uh, of yesterday's debate and that we now have the report of the Smith Commission. This has been a promise made and a promise uh, delivered. As Lord Smith him himself said, this will make the Parliament more powerful, more accountable and more autonomous. And I would urge the Scottish Government to try and be as radical in social justice as the Smith Commission has been on more powers for the Scottish Parliament. The constitutional discussion is now over. We have a legislative programme in place. We have Order the Smith and Commission Mr. Kelly's last with 30 more seconds. powers. And the job of all of us is to take action to bridge the inequality gap, get greater access in education, avert the crisis in the NHS and tackle low pay in order that we can make progress to a better Scotland. It's time for this government to step up and to get on with the job that the public are paying you to do. Thanks very much. I now call on Deputy First Minister John Swinney to wind up the debate. Mr Swinney, you have until five o'clock. Thank you, President Officer. And can I thank Mr Kelly and colleagues for their um, words about my appointment as the Deputy First Minister of Scotland. Um, the, uh, members may have noticed there was a bit of surprise on my face when it became apparent at about four o'clock we were moving to the wind-up speeches, which, as, my, as Parliament would expect of a Finance Minister, I began to make a calculation of how long I would have to speak, and I didn't quite think it was going to be as long as the 17 minutes that lie ahead of me. Um, but I was passed a, a little note at the time by uh, my, one of my friends in the Conservative Party, Liz Smith, um, who said that my speaking time was uh, as a result of the privilege of being Deputy First Minister. Uh, a cheering thought. Uh, thank you very much for that, Ms Smith. Um, Liz Smith went on in the note to say, uh, but we will intervene several times. And on a day when promises made by politicians are under great scrutiny, I do hope that's a promise the Conservatives will keep. <laughs> Let, let, me, let me intervene straight away, Mr Swinney. Was your concern about uh, taking 
extra time to speak because you didn't really have terribly much to say about the government's programme. <laughs> oh. We'll see, we'll see if I manage to fill the time irrespective of Conservative <laughs> interventions. We'll just see how we got on with that. I was also a little bit perplexed by the, the comments of... Well, not perplexed, I was delighted with what Rod, Roderick Campbell said. Uh, he described 1964 as a significant year. Um, I thought he was about to say it was the year in which the Deputy First Minister was born onto this earth. But no, it was actually the last time a succession bill was put to the Parliament affecting Scotland. So it was an interesting uh, mix-up in the speech that he was making. Can I address a few points that colleagues have made uh, as part of uh, in my opening remarks? Malcolm Chisholm raised a number of issues, specific points that I'd like to address. First of all, on Palamas. And I want to assure Mr Chisholm, as I hope Mr Ewing assured the Chamber on Tuesday, particularly in response to the questions from Alison Johnson and colleagues from, uh, questions from a number of colleagues, the Government regrets very much what has happened at Palamas. It has not been for the lack of public sector investment in supporting the development of wave technology. Far from it. Um, but the Palamas have found themselves in a situation where uh, they face... Uh, difficulties with their sustainability and I give the Chamber the commitment which Mr Ewing gave to Parliament on Tuesday that we will do everything we can to establish Wave Energy Scotland to take forward and to ensure that the achievements that have been made by Palamas of which there have been many in the years of their investment are able to be sustained and uh, to bring a benefit to the wider renewable energy debate within Scotland. Mr Chisholm also asked about the progress on private rented tenancies and there is a consultation on reform of these tenancies and the Minister for Housing uh, will bring forward uh, legislation before the end of this parliamentary session uh, to address these issues. Mr Chisholm also asked... Uh, of course. Patrick Harvey. I, I'm grateful. The verbal commitment that I believe has been given is that the legislation would have time to pass during this session, not just that it would be introduced during this session. I'll, I'll be speaking tonight at a public meeting with NUS and Shelter Scotland about this very issue. If I'm asked, am I confident that the government will introduce this legislation in time for it to pass during this session, what should I tell them? I, th I think Mr. Mr. Mr Harvey would be able to say that that would be uh, his belief that the government will do so, and that's what the government will endeavour to do in the, in the remainder of this parliamentary session. Mr Chisholm also asked about changes in the law in respect of stocking and in the light of a recent court case the government is considering possible changes to the law concerning the use of non-harassment orders. Um, other colleagues have raised the issue around the, um, the question of Mr Finlay's bill on lobbying and the government's position is set out at paragraph 226 of the programme for government document which gives the commitment by the government through Parliament's standing orders that we'd initiate legislation before the end of the parliamentary session, but we want to await the outcome of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee inquiry into lobbying before we determine the best way forward. And I think at a time when the, Parliament is being, when the government is being uh, prodded to ensure that we properly respect the deliberations of parliamentary committees, I think it's only reasonable that the government uh, fulfils that commitment in the way that I have expressed it. The final specific point that Mr Chisholm raised uh, uh, that I want to address is on uh, community empowerment. And Mr Chisholm gave us an example of uh, one case in his own constituency, uh, the Grant and Improvement Society, if I picked him up correctly, uh, which was a, a case about access to uh, a public building. And one of the issues that has become apparent to me as we've prepared the Community Empowerment Bill, um, which is a bill designed to create, remove barriers to communities acquiring public sector assets and being able to use those assets in a completely different way to secure better outcomes in communities, one of the obstacles might be the rules that I preside over in the Scottish Public Finance Manual, which require public assets to be disposed of at market value. And we've now changed the Public Finance Manual to make it more practical and tangible for public servants to be able to consider whether a better and more effective use of a public building may in fact be to come to an agreement with a local uh, organisation, a community organisation, which could de deliver uh, different outcomes and better outcomes for people in a community, rather than the public first getting market value for uh, a particular facility. And that's been a reform that we've undertaken to make it easier for community organisations uh, to thrive. Let me now turn to the issue of health, which has uh, been... Uh, of course... 
Stephanie Manor. I thank Deputy First Minister for giving way. Um, the Scottish Government recently concluded its consultation on dogs and microchipping, and many of us in the Chamber expected a dogs bill to come forward in this legislative programme, given some of the horrific attacks in my home city of Dundee and across this country. Did the Government consider a dogs bill in this programme, and can we expect one to come forward? First Minister. Obviously, the, the, the issues that arise out of a consultation uh, in relation to these issues have to be considered properly and, and fully. Uh, that consideration has not come to a conclusion yet, but obviously the Government will update uh, Parliament on its thinking in due course. On the, the issues of health, um, let me make a, a, a couple of points um, on issues that Mary Scanlon raised in the debate. Um, Mary Scanlon made, uh, I understand, you know, as I would freely acknowledge, heartfelt uh, comments in relation to um, the, the, the instances and, 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 and the terrible situation around C. diff in the Vale of Leven Hospital. And I think, um, certainly where I followed the argument put forward by Mary Scanlon, Ms Scanlon suggested that the Government did not wake up to this issue until Lord Maclean reported. I, I do not think that is in any way a fair characterisation of what the Government has done. When the instances and the scale of the, well, when instances of C. diff became apparent in the Vale of Leven Hospital, the government started a programme which, over time, has reduced the instance of uh, C. diff by over 75%. And of course, the Health Secretary made clear to Parliament on Tuesday that the recommendations and the report of Lord Maclean has given the government substantive thinking to take forward to address some of these questions. And of course, uh, we have made clear that the recommendation that uh, Lord Maclean made uh, about uh, the closure of wards, if the inspector it believes that to be justified, is one that the government has accepted and has taken forward. And in the wider debate about the improvement in quality in our hospitals, hospitals the, the hospital standardised mortality rate has fallen by 16 per cent, which I think is a testament to the patient safety programmes that have been taken forward by the National Health Service. Um, Mrs Scanlon also made the point that um, Th th there were issues about access to accident emergency uh, services and of course the government is trying to encourage indeed only this week the government launched in consort with the National Health Service media campaigns to encourage members of the public during the winter period when accident emergency departments get busier uh, than they are at other times in the year um, to think carefully about whether a visit to an accident emergency department is actually required or whether there could be other alternatives taken forward. To strengthen access to GP appointments, the Government has, of course, just put in place new resources to support the primary care sector and particular GP practices, and those resources will become apparent um, as we proceed through this and the next financial year. If I could now turn to a couple of issues on local government that have been raised. And first of all, uh, and, and I, I, I think I'm in danger of perhaps ruining Mr Rowley's reputation, but commend Alec Rowley on yet another thoughtful and substantive speech to Parliament. Um, Mr Rowley has advanced the argument. I, I said to him in the Parliamentary Committee when I appeared in front of the Local Government Committee yesterday that I could not share uh, with him at that stage in the day the announcements that were going to be made on the review of Local Government Finance, but that I hoped he and the Committee would not be disappointed by what the First Minister announced yesterday afternoon. The purpose of the review of Local Government Finance is designed to be inclusive. It is designed to, well, we, we've said it will be taken, it's a recommendation first of the Local Government Committee, and I thank Mr Stewart and his colleagues for the recommendation. Uh, we have decided to take it forward in collaboration with our local authority partners uh, to ensure that uh, COSLA are firmly involved in the establishment of the Local Authority Review of Finance, and they clearly have a, a, an immensely significant interest in all of that, and to make sure that there can be wide participation of all political parties in that process, and that will be the open and inclusive way in which the Government takes this forward. I'll give way to Mr James Cameron. Kelp. Thank the Deputy First Minister for giving way. Can I just ask why, from now until the conclusion of the review, it's going to be nearly a year? Surely, if these issues are, are so important, uh, I accept that they've got to be you know, considered properly, but why does it have to take a year? If Mr. if Mr Kelly goes back to look, for example, at the Butt Review, which took, must have taken place about 2005, 2006, somewhere around about then, my recollection was it was of perhaps even a longer timescale. These issues are, you know, I can assure Mr Kelly, I've spent a large part of my life looking at local government finance, perhaps too much of my life looking at local government finance, and there are tremendously complex issues that have to be wrestled with. I listened to his, 
his um, point about the fact that the Smith Commission had done its work in a matter of weeks. I don't think there's a queue of people outside of Parliament recommending the timescale of the Smith Commission as the most ideal consultative process to be undertaken. But having said that, um, the, we need to give proper consideration to all of these issues, and I do hope that members of all political parties will be willing to take part in the, uh, in, in the process. I thought the most um, disgraceful comment of the afternoon was Mr McIntosh's characterisation of my approach to negotiation with local authorities. Um, he used the word blackmail, which I thought was unworthy of him and unworthy of the negotiated settlements. The ne I stress the negotiated settlements that I have always managed to agree with the leadership of local government, and I'm delighted that once again we have an agreed negotiated local authority settlement. It is, of course, in stark contrast to the settlements that were put in place by my predecessors, which I don't remember ever being negotiated, and they certainly never had much settlement about them as a consequence. Um, of course, Mr McIntosh. Can I just clarify? I, I don't think Mr Swinney was seeing, uh, offering, asking council colleagues to swim with the fishes, but, uh, but I do think, and perhaps you can clarify this, that he gave them two options. One, sign up, agree the council tax fees and get a more generous deal, or don't sign up and get a very less generous deal. Get the first that one, sir? I, would say, I, I, I would say that was a negotiated settlement uh, in my book. <laughs> um, the, <laughs> Mr Rowley made, made, made a point which is very relevant to the local government debate, but it's also relevant to the health debate that I've just referred to, which is on the whole question of... The, the, if Mr Chisholm would allow me to develop this point, and then I will give way to him was on the relationship between the, um, the, the, the public sector reform work that we're undertaking on health and social care integration and the tackling of uh, the issues around, that we face around delayed discharges. And the point I made to the local government committee yesterday, which Mr Early would have heard, is that ensuring sensible, coordinated, collaborative arrangements to meeting the needs of individuals in our society is utterly central to the resolution of the health and social care challenge that we face. And uh, I said yesterday, and my colleague, the Health Secretary, and my colleague, the um, Social Justice Secretary, are both concentrating on ensuring the government works collaboratively with our health boards and our local authorities to work together to resolve these issues. Um, but they will only be resolved in a spirit of partnership and in the fashion that Mr Rowley characterised. So I'll give way to Mr Rowley. Away. It was just a thought that was triggered by his words, negotiated settlement. The Smith Commission was a negotiated settlement. Why did he sign it yesterday and rubbish it today? Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I, I'll come on to say a little bit more about it if I have time, because I'm running out of time. My goodness. Well, I, I, better, get, I better get on to the Smith Commission now, since, I, I, since I, I, I don't want to disappoint anyone with what I say. I, I went into the Smith Commission with uh, explaining to the public that I accepted that the Smith Commission would not deliver independence for Scotland. So by my very act of going in the door, I compromised on the... Well, I, 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 is, is Mr Finlay remotely interested in hearing this, or has he just come in here for the usual five o'clock pub brawl that he's involved in? <laughs> um, I went into the Smith Commission recognising that the Smith Commission would not be able to deliver Scottish independence. So we compromised to go in the room from the very beginning. And what we tried to do was encourage a process of the Smith Commission listening to the views of people outside of the Smith Commission. And they did. Jackie Bailey is absolutely right. They did listen. They listened carefully and then ignored the Scottish Trade Union Congress exactly. on the issue of devolving exactly. equalities legislation or devolving the minimum wage or devolving the ability to resolve many of the issues in our welfare system that SCVO asked for by devolving the welfare system. So the Smith Commission listened, but it didn't take heed of the issues that were concerning many groups within our society. So, and what I said, and what I said this morning, and what I said this morning was absolutely crystal clear. I welcomed, as the First Minister welcomed at question time at lunchtime today, the additional powers. Why would that be a surprise to anybody? I voted for the Scotland Act in 1998 as a member of the House of Commons. It didn't deliver independence. It delivered more power for Scotland. I voted for the 
uh, the LCM process that brought the Scotland Act in 2012 into being, because I believe that we should accept more powers into the Parliament. But don't insult the intelligence of groups around the country that want more powers by saying that somehow the Smith Commission fulfils all of the ambitions of the people of Scotland, because clearly it did not do that in what it announced this morning. So we participated in the Smith Commission in good faith to secure the best outcome for the people of Scotland that we could. We have achieved as much as we could. But in the words of one of the contributors to the debate today, uh, there is a, a process of constitutional debate that is being undertaken in Scotland today that affects the social and economic choices that we can make as a country. This government wants to be able to take the boldest social and economic choices we can, and we can only do that with the full powers of independence. That concludes the debate on the Scottish Government's programme for government to 14.15. We now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of four parliamentary bureau motions. Members should be aware that a revised Section A setting out a revision to today's business has been issued and copies are available at the back of the Chamber. It includes two additional Parliamentary Bureau motions on commitment membership and substitution on committees. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motions numbers 11689 and 1178 on committee membership and 11690 and 11739 on substitution on committees. Formally moved. The questions on these motions will be put at decision time to, put, to which we now come. There are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is at motion number 11689, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on, commi on committee membership be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 11690, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on substitutions on committees be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 1178, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on committee membership, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 1179, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on substitutions on committees, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time, and I now close this meeting.